Welcome to Peace Corps 2.0, a symposium, a time to highlight the founding of Peace Corps 60 years ago and to reflect on Peace Corps today. I'm Nicola Dino, and I served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Ecuador, 1994 through 97 in rural public health program. I live in Portland, Oregon, where the Museum of the Peace Corps was founded in the year 2000. Pat Wand and I are co-chairs of the Museum of the Peace Corps Experience, and we'll be hosting this symposium today. Hi, I'm Pat Wand. I served in Colombia from 1963 to 1965 in a rural community development and health education program. We are delighted to welcome you to a symposium commemorating the National Conference on Youth Service Abroad held on American University campus, March 29 to 31 in 1961. That was just four weeks after President John Kennedy signed the executive order to create Peace Corps. Student leaders from the University of Michigan and American University joined with the National Student Association to host 500 students from 45 states. They discuss the basic building blocks of the new Peace Corps and recommended those building blocks to Sergeant Shriver, the Peace Corps founder and his team. We'll hear, hear more about that conference later. First, Peter Starr, acting provost of American University joins us to welcome you. As provost, Dr. Starr represents the academic programs in eight schools and colleges across the university. I am pleased to introduce Acting Provost Peter Starr. Thank you, Pat, and welcome all. Uh, it's a great pleasure. I was part of the early conversations with Pat about this a number of years ago, and I'm so delighted to see it come to fruition. So it's my honor to welcome everybody virtually, I'm sorry we're not face-to-face, -to, -face, to the Peace Corps 2022.0 Symposium presented in conjunction with the ongoing exhibition Peace Corps at 60, Inside the Volunteer Experience, which I hope many of you have had the opportunity to visit online. On behalf of the AU administration, I'd like to acknowledge the exceptional work of Jack Rasmussen and his wonderful colleagues in the AU Museum at the Katzen Art Center, and to recognize the outstanding partners from the Museum of the Peace Corps Experience and the National Peace Corps Association. We greatly appreciate all who have contributed to the symposium's or organization and execution. As we commemorate the historic conference that took place on AU's campus 60 years ago, we reflect on the key role that student leaders played in developing the framework for the Peace Corps. We also look forward to supporting the agency's continuing evolution as it enters this, its seventh decade of global impact. Many thanks to the speakers and panelists who will share their perspectives on the past, present, and future of the Peace Corps throughout the next few hours. American University is honored to count among our alumni, some of whom are here, I see many returned Peace Corps volunteers, and we're committed to preparing our students to serve communities around the world in the years to come. So thank you for attending. Welcome. Congratulations to Nicola and Pat. And Nicola, I think it's back to you. Thank you, Dr. Starr, great words. We're here also to welcome on behalf of the Peace Corps community, Glenn Bloomhorst. Glenn served as a volunteer in Guatemala, 1988 to 1991. As president of the National Peace Corps Association, Glenn and staff bring together former volunteers and supporters to advocate for Peace Corps, address pressing issues in the community, and increase the visibility of Peace Corps values. Glenn? Nicole, thank you so much for that introduction. And first and foremost, congratulations to both you and Pat uh, as the co-leaders of the Muse uh, Committee for Museum of the Peace Corps Experience for championing this event and for making it possible. A, a, a huge thank you also to Provost Starr and uh, uh, Dr. Remison over at uh, American University it's, uh, this is a, a tremendous and very exciting event today. I'm really looking forward to the speakers and panelists. And on behalf of the 240,000 individuals who share the Peace Corps experience uh, and have 
served in 160 plus countries uh, over the last 60 years. I'm very grateful for your service and I want to thank you for your service, uh, many of whom have served many times, multiple times um, in, in, in the history of the, uh, the Peace Corps. Thank you and congratulations uh, to uh, both the Committee for the Museum of Peace Corps Experience and to American University for this partnership uh, with NPCA as well. Uh, we are just so pleased to be continuing the series of events that we have had with American University. Partnerships with universities uh, form the core of uh, the work that is being done here domestically for the Peace Corps community. And we're so grateful uh, that American University continues to partner with us in this way. As, as we celebrate our 60th anniversary, we are also looking forward to the future. I'm uh, really grateful that Dr. Grant is here with us from the Peace Corps. I know that uh, the Peace Corps Agency and the interim leadership over there have been working very hard on um, retooling and reshaping the Peace Corps for this very different world that we live in. And very grateful for their leadership and stewardship of that uh, institution that we all care so much about. Look forward to hearing more of her comments on, on the future of the Peace Corps, in particular the redeployment of the volunteers when those conditions that we're in right now permit that. Um, but I also just ask each of us as members of the community or the Peace Corps community, whether you have already served or whether you're yet to serve or are thinking about serving someday or know somebody who's served or just love the idea of the Peace Corps, please get behind and support the Peace Corps. Make sure your members of Congress know how important the Peace Corps is to America and to the future of our world and how important the return Peace Corps volunteers are, Peace Corps volunteers around the world and return volunteers are around the world as we continue to serve uh, through a lifetime of service. Join NPCA, it's free to be a part of the community, rpcv.org, and we'll look forward to, get, forward to getting to know you and, and keeping informed, engaged, and connected. Thank you so much, and thank you, Nicole, for uh, this opportunity to share a few moments with you. Thank you, Glenn, appreciate your words. We have one more important welcoming message. Alexandra Schumann, is the Alper Initiative for Washington Art Fellow and a graduate student in the MA Art History Program. She really did make a significant contribution in curating the 60th anniversary exhibition, Peace Corps at 60. Allie, take it away. Hello everyone. Thank you to Pat, to Nicole, and to all of you for joining us here today. I've been honored to have had the opportunity to curate the exhibition, Peace Corps at 60, Inside the Volunteer Experience, with the American University Museum's director, Jack Rasmussen, who has guided the show with his curatorial eye and expertise. I also want to give a huge thank you to Christiane Scher, our associate director, Elizabeth Cowgill, our marketing and publication specialist, Kevin Runyon, our preparator, Sarah Leary, our museum operations assistant, and Jessica Pocasey, our acting registrar. Likewise, the team at the Museum of the Peace Corps Experience has been invaluable to this exhibition. With their forces combined, they turned all of these ideas into reality. After working this past year with the Museum of the Peace Corps Experience, my main takeaways have been their passion for Peace Corps' mission and commitment to collaboration. Their team is truly motivated by the spirit of service and they are dedicated to promoting the impact of the agency and keeping a close dialogue with the active Peace Corps community. The virtual exhibition on view now at the AU Museum's website expresses that commitment through the Museum of the Peace Corps Experiences collection. Returned volunteers donated objects and related stories about the personal connections they made working together with their host country counterparts. The selection of stories and objects in this exhibition are microcosms of a greater musician uh, mission to make a better community and better world. I hope by looking through the exhibition and attending the symposium, you are able to enrich your understanding of Peace Corps and think about ways we all strive to be better to each other, to better understand each other and by extension ourselves. And I, with that, I turn it back to you, Pat and Nicole. Great, thanks, Allie. It has been a pleasure working with you. So next we have a poll coming up on your screen and it's your chance to tell us and one another where you fit into the big tent we call Peace Corps. Click on your answer and soon we'll see how many served in each area. Wow, I see it coming up already so quick. Most of us served between 61 and 80, looks like um, 60%. 
So that is pretty good. Then kind of divided between the 81 and 2000 and 2001 and 2021. And I see that about 13% of you have are thinking about becoming volunteers. So that's great. You haven't served yet, but there's always time. You know, there's no age limit. The conference is divided into three segments. So the first part is the student voices panel. Second part is the many faces of Peace Corps panel. And third is the final segment, which offers you a chance to discuss in breakout rooms, the impact of Peace Corps. You will also hear stories from 1961 conference highlights from Peace Corps Connect to the future, future report um, <clears throat> issued by NPCA. And finally, a few words from the special advisor to the director of Peace Corps. I just wanna backtrack there are the stories from the 1961 conference. You don't wanna miss those. Our first panel commemorates the student conference in March, 1961. Unlike six decades ago, today we have returned Peace Corps volunteers or RPCVs to reflect candidly on their cross-cultural experiences in communities around the world. I am delighted to introduce the panel moderator, Elizabeth Warden, who served in Moldova, 1997 through 99. Dr. Warden is now Associate Professor, School of Education at American University, and will moderate the panel. She will introduce our three panelists and moderate the Q&A. Okay, Elizabeth, take it away. Great, thank you so much for the introduction. And thank you, Pat, for inviting me to be part of Peace Corps 2.0, a symposium. I'm so excited to be here. Um, we have the Student Voices panel, and our first student I'd like to introduce is Evie Betancourt, who is from the Poconos, Pennsylvania. Evie served in St. Lucia from 2017 to 2020 and is earning a master's in international relations. Next, I'd like, to I'd like to introduce Gwen Schaefer, who hails from Madisonville, Kentucky. Gwen served in Ukraine from 2013 to 2014 and Macedonia from 2014 to 2016 and is currently earning a master's of international service in the executive track. Last, we have Matthew Ridgway, whose hometown is Lake Forest, California. Matthew served in Georgia from 2017 to 2019 and is earning a dual MBA and master's in intercultural and international communications. So welcome you three. We've asked our three panelists to reflect upon two questions. First, what does Peace Corps have right about its operations? And second, what do you think are the greatest challenges and opportunities that lie ahead for Peace Corps? After our speakers' reflections, we'll open it up to the audience for questions and conversation for about 15 minutes. Please put questions in the chat at any time. Ali Schumann, our trusty organizer um, and facilitator, will help with those questions during the Q&A. And then we'll end with a final reflection for which we've asked the panelists to speak about which, they, which Peace Corps goal they think has had the greatest impact. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Evie. Thank you so much for the introduction, Elizabeth. Um, and thank you, Ali, and everyone that was involved with organizing it. Um, it's really exciting to see all the fellow RPCVs in the chat. And I just wish we had all night to hear everyone's stories because I always find that I am super floored to hear about everyone's experiences. Um, as we all know, no two Peace Corps experiences are the same. So it's always exciting to hear um, new stories. Um, but yes, so I served in the Eastern Caribbean from 2017 until the global evacuation. I was specifically in St. Lucia. Um, I served as an, an education volunteer as a literacy specialist um, for kindergarten through third grade, um, but I specifically worked with kindergarten and first grade and kind of gave help as needed in the other grades. And I also did a lot of work that was centered around library development, um, which I absolutely loved. I enjoyed taking the two years to reconnect with Judy Bloom and Captain Underpants books. Um, so it was great. And my school site that I was placed was um, on the east coast of St. Lucia in Denry, a small community called Ritual. 
Um, my school had about 240 students. And I like to think one of my best accomplishments was memorizing and learning everyone's names within my first month. Um, it was a high goal and I think I achieved it. Um, but one of the biggest things that I think Peace Corps really has right behind the agency is just the methodology behind a lot of things. When I had originally applied, I was applying to be a youth development volunteer. Um, I never really saw myself as a teacher. And after talking to my placement officer and going through the whole process, they were just like, you know, we think your skills would be really well suited in the Eastern Caribbean as a teacher. And then I kind of thought, I don't have any teaching experience. Are you guys sure? And they're just like, well, you know, you're going to have the support. You'll be working with um, counterparts and you'll have the training that you need. And the fact that Peace Corps believed in me and I just trusted the process and I can't imagine my service being anywhere else or doing anything. So I think the methodology behind that selection process was amazing. But then just overall, the methodology with just the interaction and the cohesiveness to make sure that there is so much collectivism and partnership that goes behind everything. Um, I had extended my service for a third year. And what I was lucky enough to see is that in the Eastern Caribbean, our project cycles are about five or six years long. And so towards the, my third year, we were coming to renew that project cycle and I got to be a part of that. And what it, the whole process just involved the Ministry of Education, principals, counterpart teachers, and other literacy specialists for other projects that coordinated with Peace Corps and local schools. And you know, everyone had a voice in it to see you know, what was going well, what wasn't working, how do we make things better? Um, and so it kind of just, it assessed like if the project was still necessary and if it was, how do we continue to improve it to make sure Peace Corps was hitting those benchmarks? So to just, you know, see that collectivism on every single level was amazing to me. Um, and as far as challenges, <laughs> I think our biggest challenge that we see now is, you know, handling COVID. Um, it was a really difficult decision for leadership to evacuate all the volunteers and like many others, I was devastated by the decision. But just in hindsight, I do think it was the right choice to make because nobody knew what how, you know, a year later, we'd still be in this virtual world with all these changes. Um, so I think that was the biggest challenge. And then keeping people encouraged and excited, especially those that should have already started service or those that were in training, people that were invited and are delayed. I'm sorry you didn't get to start your experience yet. Um, so I think like that, keeping the excitement up is probably one of the biggest challenges, but it's it opens the doors for a whole new world um, and opportunities. Um, in the past year, you know, they started a virtual pilot program where people who probably didn't have the chance or the opportunity to do Peace Corps could volunteer in their own way remotely, which I think is really cool. Great, thanks so much, Evie. All right, Gwen, turn it over to you. All right, well, thank you for the introduction and I'm really honored to join all of you all today. Um, I echo Evie, it's, I wish we had infinite time to hear everyone's stories because they're all fascinating in their own right and I'm just excited to, to share mine today. Um, I began my Peace Corps service in Ukraine and back in the fall of 2013. I joined right after I finished my undergraduate degree in international development, and I was assigned to be a secondary education volunteer there. Um, when I arrived in my training village, which was located in Northern Ukraine near the border with Belarus, I really felt like a fish out of water. I joined the Peace Corps under the old application system where I did not have a say in where I was going. And I really didn't expect to find myself in Eastern Europe when I signed up for the Peace Corps. I was kind of expecting that Peace Corps stereotype, which was living somewhere warm with mosquitoes and no indoor plumbing. Um, it turns out there's still plenty of bugs in Ukraine, um, but it was certainly not warm whatsoever. <laughs> um, on the surface level, a lot of things also seem very similar to life back home. Um, but as the Peace Corps Ukraine staff constantly reminded us, you really cannot make assumptions and you must look beneath the surface to understand the local context. They hammered that into us. And I think that's something that they did really well. Um, what they also did really well was our rigorous training program. So in Ukraine, it, you know, I did about four hours, four to five hours of Ukrainian language classes in the morning, followed by cultural training and teaching in the local schools in the afternoon. So gaining that practical experience, um, you know, from the from the get go. The Peace for Ukraine staff really went above and beyond when it came to our training schedule 
making sure that we would be prepared when we were eventually scattered across a really enormous country. I was welcomed by a very kind host family who really went out of their way to assist me in my acclimation, um, even trying to shield my ears when they went out to slaughter the family pig one day. Um, however, through that experience, they found out that actually I was the one that grew up in a rural part of Kentucky and had seen such things before. Um, and as moments like that in Peace Corps, we really got to bond and learn about um, each other's cultures and the similarities that, and the differences that do exist. Um, but unfortunately, during my pre-service training, the, the political landscape began to dramatically change in Ukraine. Uh, part of the country erupted in protests against President Yanukovych and, and Russia. I eventually did make it to my permanent site in Zalishiki, which is a, a small town in far western Ukraine near Romania. And I settled into my teaching assignment at the local high school. I had a lot of support from Peace Corps. I bonded my counterpart, students, et cetera. But unfortunately, you know, it was all pretty short-lived. Uh, things turned very violent. I was eventually ordered to evacuate in February 2014. Um, as I boarded a bus, I said goodbye to my counterpart thinking, all right, I'm going to return as soon as things calm down. Um, but I never did as a Peace Corps volunteer. And as I'm sure as the volunteers who evacuated last year can relate, it was an incredibly difficult experience. Um, I was in the, experiencing an emotionally charged situation. Uh, but I was also suddenly back in the U.S. on my parents' couch without any plans nor source of income. And there wasn't a lot of, you know, what comes next um, at, at that time. It was unclear whether Ukraine would open back up. And, you know, when, when talking with Peace Corps about what to do next, it was, I'm either going to wait for an unspecified amount of time to, to return or choose an entirely new country and start my service all over again. And it really felt like an impossible choice at the time, uh, like I would be abandoning you know, my, my community. Um, but unfortunately, as Russia became more assertive in Ukraine, it, the writing was kind of on the wall. Um, so I ended up accepting a new volunteer position, but this time in, in Macedonia. Um, there I was again, a secondary education volunteer and I entered my service with renewed excitement, but I also had a little bit better understanding of what I was getting myself into this time around. I was um, again assigned to work in a high school, uh, this time in a small town uh, called Barovo on the, on the border with Bulgaria. And my goal was really to co-teach with local counterparts, um, collaborating on infusing communicative technology methodology and critical thinking in the classroom. Um, my counterparts were really great, warm, excellent teachers. They'd worked with volunteers before, but I remember meeting with them for the first time and thinking that, and they're very experienced teachers, and I'm questioning, what can I offer them as a young volunteer? Why did, why did Peace Corps Macedonia staff send me here? But then really after actively listening to them and hearing their needs, I understood that I wasn't really there to dramatically change anything. I was there to create a space that prompted others and myself to listen to needs, to think outside the box, try new things, expand perceptions you know, about this, about the surrounding world. And ultimately I really loved my site. And part of that was because, you know, with Peace Corps Macedonia support, I had an adopted family that took me under the wing, made me feel like I was part of their lives and it became a home away from home. Um, Peace Corps Macedonia did a fantastic job of connecting volunteers and communities to create dynamic secondary projects. So additional work outside of our main jobs. Um, and that led me to becoming the program director of Camp Girls Leading Our World, or Camp Blue, which was started originally by Peace Corps volunteers, but in Macedonia, it's now run by a local NGO and, and has, still has volunteer support. And, and it was really through that experience that I had my most impactful moments as a volunteer. I saw young women from different ethnic backgrounds join together, many for the first time, and simply interact as young campers would which was a really big deal in an ethnically fractured state like Macedonia. You know, they learned silly camp songs, camped out in tents for the first time. And through the courses they conduct, conducted, they also openly talked about what it meant to be a young woman and how they could overcome barriers in their lives and pursue their passions and lead their generation in Macedonia. Um, and so, you know, this is a really great period of learning and growth. And I, I'm still in contact with former campers. I've seen them turn into camp counselors. And now as the years pass into young professionals, then it really gives me a lot of happiness to see their continued success. And that was really 
with Peace Corps support to yes, put yourself into you know, your primary site and your main job in the school that I worked at, which was also great, but it was also looking at the whole community and, and looking at the connections and, and finding other opportunities for success as well. And so Camp Flow really encapsulated my Peace Corps service. It was a time of connection, cross-cultural learning and understanding. And to me, that that's really what the Peace Corps was all about for me. Thanks so much, Gwen. And I just have to add a note as well. I too was shocked to be going to a post-socialist state, former Soviet Union. And I was shocked that Peace Corps would send volunteers to places that were so cold. So I'm sure for those of you who are Peace Corps volunteers in the former socialist space and post-Soviet space in the 90s and in 2000s, you can relate to that. Anyways, thank you so much, Gwen. And so not last but not least, we have Matthew. Take it away. Great, thank you. <clears throat> and um, thank you for allowing me this platform to share my story. It's uh, so awesome to hear both Evie and, and Gwen's stories as well. Um, it just kind of brings back a lot of memories. Um, I also participated in, in GLOW Georgia as well, Gwen. So I, yeah, I know how wonderful that program is. Um, so just to kind of give you a little background on um, the program that I was in, I served in uh, former Soviet states, uh, the Republic of Georgia uh, from 2017 to 2019. And my uh, program was an organizational development program, which essentially they signed volunteers to NGOs and local governmental agencies uh, to work side by side with a counterpart to, to build uh, capacity in different functional areas. Could be business operations, it could be media marketing, it could be programming. Um, and I was assigned to an organization called the Betty Annie Children's Center. Uh, this assignment was, um, pretty unusual for the program because um, in fact, it was actually an orphanage. Uh, so this orphanage was located in a, a remote mountainous village in Tsalka, which is, I still can't pronounce that name right, Tsalka, uh, which is about 70 kilometers from the capital, which sounds quite, kind of close, but um, the road was quite uh, long, quite treacherous. Um, the village uh, actually in the picture behind me, uh, my background is where I served. Um, so here there was about, I was told there's about 40 families that lived there, but in actuality, on a full-time basis, uh, there was probably about 20 families that lived there. So it was very, very small, um, but I loved it. It was beautiful, as you can see from, from the picture. So my, my role at the organization was really to work with the staff to, um, to really focus in on their, the, to, to develop the skills in project design and management. And so they had a lot of younger staff there that were um, actually former children of the orphanage that were aging out and wanting to give back and, and volunteering. So my role really worked with them to help them learn some of the skill sets so they can carry on and, and really contribute um, after I left. So I worked with them to um, design and implement a uh, training uh, technology center. Uh, prior to this, the uh, center did not have any sort of educational programming or any technology resources. And they really wanted to, to improve their offerings for the children. Because um, uh, as you may see, the, the village is quite small and there's not really anything outside the school where the kids can, can go to. So providing a space for them that's comfortable, um, that they can access new technology, where they can do trainings and educational things was a, was a core uh, objective of the, of the nonprofit. And so uh, we were able to carry out this, this program. Um, we applied for a grant through the SPA, um, USA Grant Peace Corps program. And uh, we carried this out through uh, over the course of six months. And it was really, really fulfilling experience because you know, really getting to, to not necessarily myself do the work, but really help you know, facilitate the, the, the thinking around it, right? Like what is that cultural context? And, and really me being an outsider coming in I, I, I needed to be that person walking from behind and not walking forward. So really working with the local staff to really brainstorm these ideas out, what fits for the context that they're in and, and what's gonna actually sustain moving forward. So um, after getting together and countless meetings and discussions and all this stuff, we were able to put together this project and we had new computers, uh, projectors, we even got a virtual reality uh, headset. So now there's virtual reality in this small little village. Um, so this is just one of the examples of, of the type of things that I've, I did with the organization. Um, in addition to that, um, I worked a lot with the children. And early on, I realized that in order to be really effective at the center, um, I really had to become their family. 
Um, I wasn't working out of an office. It was really their home. This is where these kids lived. This is where the staff lived. And you don't just go into somebody's home and start telling them what to do. So I really had to be, I really had to immerse myself and become family with them. So I would help cook for the kids. I would help chop wood during the winter time, endless, endless amounts of wood. Uh, I would take them out on games, we'd go hiking. Um, really beyond just being a facilitator for the staff, I was also a role model for them. And it was such a fulfilling experience. And, and when I think about what Peace Corps got right, um, it has to be where they sent me and the place they assigned me to. Um, and, I, and I think like this is a testament to like the, the systems and processes that have in place uh, to get to fit people in that role where they're going to have the greatest value and impacts, not just in the communities they serve, but on the individuals that go there as well. So, um, so nowadays, I guess volunteers are able to, to choose a site. They can apply to a program um, and apply to a country. Um, I ended up not doing that. And I ended up leaving it up to trust in the system as, as Evie mentioned. And uh, I think that really paid off for me. And I think that really, um, you know, opened my eyes to a new world that I had never been to before because prior to uh, Peace Corps Georgia, I um, actually didn't really know what Georgia was. So uh, when I first uh, heard about Georgia, I quickly Googled it and researched all this information. So really just opening up those doors and stuff. Um, I guess moving on to just some of the challenges, I think COVID uh, obviously is a big, big challenge that um, everyone's facing. I think that um, something that maybe they can improve more from based off my experience is to uh, provide a more robust range of mental health support services to, to volunteers. I think as, as Evie mentioned, like every volunteer's experience is different, even within the, the, uh, the organizations uh, and the sites within the same country. And uh, everyone deals with that differently. So I think uh, while they did give us strategies to cope with it and there was sort of an informal volunteer network, I think having more um, you know, formalized support services for volunteers to help deal with some of those challenges. Uh, I think moving forward, uh, some of the opportunities, uh, I think engaging the private sector would be very beneficial. I saw that just during my service. Uh, I think there was only one organization that a volunteer worked with that I saw really did a great job of engaging the private sector. And um, you could just tell that the impact uh, and the sustainability was um, a lot higher as a result of having that partnership in the community. Um, so from there, uh, I guess I'll close it out and hand this back over to you, Elizabeth. Great, thanks so much, Matthew. Um, I like so much what you said, walking behind, not walking forward. That should be a Peace Corps motto. Um, I don't think people, I, we might not have given folks enough time for questions. So I will start us off and take advantage of being a moderator. Um, there are 13% of the audience that have not done Peace Corps yet or are thinking about Peace Corps. So if I could hear from each one of you, um, what you wish you had known before your Peace Corps service. And for all the RPCVs out there, please put in the chat what you wish you had known um, before you started your Peace, Peace Corps service that you can share with future volunteers or, or those who are thinking about volunteering. So Evie, are you ready? Okay, Let's start with you. Um, yeah, well, what I wish I had known is honestly something that really would have only come with experience anyway, but um, I wish I had a better understanding of what the public perception of Peace Corps was. Um, like statistically, when you look at Peace Corps, the majority of volunteers often tend to be middle-class white people. Um, so when I had gone to my country of service, I, in my cohort alone, I was one of seven people of color. Um, and I was the second volunteer at my site who also happened to be a black woman before me, but still when I came across people and in St. Lucia, the majority of the population is black, but there was still this whole, Peace Corps has black people, white, since when? And it was just the shock that um, that everyone had. But I think it was a really cool opportunity to, you know, talk about that. Like, oh, no, yeah, Peace Corps is super diverse. And also, um, you know, not everyone is afforded the opportunity to volunteer. If you come from low income families, you know, it's hard to uproot and leave for two years with little to no income. So I think really 
it was, I just, I wish I was prepared to have those conversations and that interaction, but it was such a learning curve. And I do appreciate that it was such a teachable moment um, for myself and, you know, my host country. Great, thanks, Evie, it's so thoughtful. All right, Gwen? Sure, um, a, a few thoughts. I guess first I would have, I would say to really focus less on the place that you're going to, but on the idea of coming ready to serve. I feel, especially now that the, the system has changed where there is more choice in the matter. I think sometimes people get caught about these expectations for what should or should not be happening and their service. And I, I've really seen a lot of volunteers and myself at times to kind of fall into the trap of, well, things should be going this way, or I should be doing this, or this whole thing should be happening a certain way. And I think by really taking a step back and say, you know, I'm here to actively listen and to do what needs to be done um, and to really serve in a meaningful way and just to be adaptable and open to change. Um, that really transformed a lot of people's experiences when they had that mental shift. And then something too that, that Matthew raised uh, that I think really can't be stated enough is um, mental health support and really making sure that you A, have your support system before you even go into service and really just acknowledging that there is going to be that um, you had to say issue concern. And that's going to be a challenge in your service. I don't know a single person who didn't have some aspect of, of mental health um, challenges in their in their services. And so really thinking through your support network and then, you know, outside of services and then in service as well. And I, I couldn't agree with Matthew's point more that that is something that needs, there needs to be something more formalized as well. Um, and then you know, just from the last point too, is this is more so for evacuated Peace Corps volunteers that may be going back into Peace Corps service. But one piece of wisdom that I would impart, um, you know, having left Ukraine and then go back to Macedonia is really having to let go a little bit to that previous experience to really be present in your second placement of service, which is a very, very hard thing to do emotionally, but it's also very rewarding. And so that's just kind of, for those of you on who are evacuees and you think you want to go back, um, I'm so glad I did, but it is also, it's its own set of challenges and being present in your second place of service is also something to think about. Great, thanks, Ben. Matthew? Yeah, I think, um... It's, it's so hard because in Peace Corps, you're, you're always on. It's like 24 seven and you know, you, you, you go in there because you have this commitment to serve. And um, sometimes that can be very, very challenging and very taxing. And I think one thing that I would have told myself is to, to practice self-care more because I think that goes back to, to what uh, Gwen was saying, like, you know, if, if you don't practice or have good self-care habits, you know, it, it, it takes you out of the moment. It takes you out of being present to your community, it takes you out of being present to, you know, what opportunities that lie in there. And, you know, the time seems like a long time, but it will fly by so quickly if, you, if you're not, you know, aware. And um, yeah, I think just knowing when to take self-care and, and practice that, um, I think will pay dividends in your service. Great, thank you so much, Matthew. And also what I'm hearing a little bit about, I think it's a responsibility of volunteers for self-care, but also a Peace Corps, right? Who it sounds like could do a better job of providing support, mental health. Evie, I think I almost heard from you, it's like a better job with Peace Corps volunteers preparing them to have conversations about diversity, about inclusion, um, to give you maybe a little bit more of a, a toolkit. Um, Great, so Ali, can I turn it over to you? Do we have any questions? I probably muddled the chat by asking people to add what they, what they wish they had known, but please share out any of those that are interesting. Yeah, we have a lot of great stuff in the chat. Some that would be great for our panelists to talk about if we have time, but um, first question is for Gwen. Um, uh, Kathleen Corey has a question. I think it might be interesting for the evacuated volunteers to hear more about letting go of Ukraine to be president, a president in Macedonia. Well, I'm glad Carson Beck Corey was my Peace Corps director in Macedonia and was there right as I uh, arrived post Ukraine. <laughs> and I would I won't elaborate too much because I, I did mention it in my last field, but 
I think it is, like I said, incredibly difficult, um, especially when you think you're going back and you're not going back and you kind of make that conscious decision to start over again, but you're also entering P um, and PS2 the second time around and like, oh, well, I know what they're going to do for this and that and the, and the other. And you kind of go on with like, your own new, new set of assumptions and biases about your second part of service. And, um, you know, I think really, like I said, for those of you that maybe then got going back in and you're not able to go back to your previous, you know, country of service, um, again, really just opening yourself up to, um, and, and kind of letting go of those assumptions and trying to start over as fresh as you can in the new environment is really crucial for your, you know, really just enjoying it the second time around in a different, in a different unique way. Great. Thanks, Gwen. Allie, what else do we have? Um, okay, so this could be anyone um, who might have an answer. How similar is the Peace Corps with AmeriCorps? Um, this is Patrick Cornegy, uh did a year with AmeriCorps last year, but doesn't have any Peace Corps experience yet. Either Matthew or even Gwen, I don't know if I have an answer to that. Um, so maybe I could share some insight. I actually did uh, two services in Peace Corps, or not Peace Corps, in AmeriCorps. And um, I, um, I thought it equipped me with some really tangible skills for the Peace Corps. And actually, I, I did AmeriCorps in anticipation, uh, in anticipation into going into Peace Corps. Um, I think it, it gets you a better sense of you know, working with the Peace Corps, it is a governmental agency working within that kind of bureaucracy and the rules and regulations. Uh, additionally, a lot of the, the language and the skill sets I think are, are transferable. Um, and, and really it just sort of instills that, that, um, that spirit of volunteerism that I think in commitment to, to, to the community that I think uh, is, is required for the Peace Corps. So I think they're directly relatable. Thanks, Matthew. Evie, did you have anything to add? Matthew was perfectly teed up for that question. <laughs> um, I didn't do AmeriCorps, but from my interactions of people who did volunteer with America, AmeriCorps, it was very similar. Um, I think in principle and the spirit of volunteerism, they align a lot. Um, the really the biggest difference is like when you factor in like the big cultural shift. Um, all right, Ali, I see a lot of questions coming in, so I'll turn it back over to you. Um, sure, a topic that came up for a few volunteers, we're talking about uh, reverse culture shock and how challenging it was for them. So I was wondering if anyone wants to share um, about how that affected in their experience. I have, Maybe, a, funny this time. <laughs> I have a story I'll share. Um, so reverse culture shock will really, it'll sneak up on you too. Um, after I did my first year, I came back for um, a short visit to see my family, it was about two weeks. And in St. Lucia, we have um, like one chain grocery store, Massey supermarkets, and the each community might have their own little small stores. Um, and it's just, you know, a small selection of things. You don't Amer um, things imported from American brands are just really expensive and there isn't a lot of it. And it's still, it tastes kind of different anyway. Um, but when I had come back to the US, I went to Walmart with my sisters and you know, one of my sisters had to get her oil changed. And just while we were going through Walmart, I just remember looking around and I was like, was this place always this big? Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, hmm, I want a snack. Like, let's go see. And I just remember going into the chip aisle and seeing the 50 different brands of Pringles and Doritos and everything. And I just stood in the aisle frozen. And I was like, oh my gosh. And <laughs> I see someone giving me two thumbs up. So they definitely relate. Um, and as I'm just like standing in the aisle, I'm just like, oh my goodness, why are there so many options? And I couldn't decide. But then one of my sisters, I, I was there for a long time, apparently because one of my sisters came like looking for me and she's like, hurry up, hurry up. It's not like that pressure of being rushed. And I just started to cry. And I was like, I just want a snack and it's so hard. And I couldn't decide. And my sister's kind of looking at me. She's like, why are you crying? What, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, I don't, I don't know. There's too many choices. Um, and another one of my sisters came and she goes, oh my gosh, she eats these Pringles. Like, let's just go. And then they dragged me out of the store. And I just remember like sitting in the car and I was like, why am I 
in tears about chips and I couldn't really wrap my mind around it. And then my, we had to go grocery shopping after that. I'm like, I'm staying in the car. And it wasn't until like I had gone back to St. Lucia to, you know, continue my service when I went grocery shopping. And I'm like, it's the simplicity. Okay. This is that, that is the culture shock everybody's talking about. Um, so, <laughs> and I think, yeah, it just, it was so surprising. And I, I know that I'm a sensitive person, but I wasn't expecting that. Um, so yeah, that was my experience with culture shock. And then I think after going through it once and kind of getting able to process what it was when I did end up, um, you know, coming back, I think, and I, culture shock hit me every single time. And I still feel like I'm processing it now. And I saw a couple comments in the chat is when you, you know, you go through service, but you're like, you're expecting that change. So it's not as shocking to the system because you know, it's going to be different, but then you also have in your mind, I'm going back to the U S and what I know. And it's, you know, it's not because you're coming back a different person. Um, and, and a different person in so many ways, you know, more evolved or whatever it is, but just like the two years being used to your service, there are things you don't expect. So even as part of the evacuation, coming back to just like an eerie quiet airport and everyone has masks and then just processing all of those things. I just remember like looking at my dad through the mask and I was like, I don't, can I hug you? Do I hug you? I, is it safe, dad? I don't, I'm scared because I just went through an airport and you know, in the first like month of the evacuation, I kind of just, I quarantined um, at my house, but I had to like stay in my room by myself for the two weeks. And then just like the extra two weeks after quarantine, I still stayed in my room just trying to process. And then when I finally did go outside, just every single thing shocked my system. <laughs> Evie, that's wonderful. I think so many of us relate to that. Those really small unexpected things like chips and the pressure to choose the chips in the supermarket. So thank you so much. Matthew or Gwen, do you have anything to share? Or we can we can jump to another question if if not. I was just gonna piggyback off of that. Um, I think though one of the I I completely relate to the tip store. I certainly have my own version of that. Um, one thing that was really nice when I came back the second time around is I happened to be moving to DC at that time where there's of course a huge return Peace Corps volunteer community. But even if I had been in DC, I think really understanding how to tap into the RPCV community was really a great source of support and just kind of through that period of normalization because it was difficult. Um, the second time around, I was going back into and jumping into a new job in America and it was a very different work style and pace and all of the above. And there was a lot of transitions to have. And so really having that source of community, I know for all of us has been, has been a really great thing. Matthew? I mean, I, I can relate to everything they say. So uh, I have nothing to add, really. <clears throat> oh, sorry, Allie? Do we, uh, what else have? we may or may not have time, but um, let's try to get one more in there, maybe. I think we have time for one more. And one then we'll more. Final reflection. Okay. Um, so this is a question from Chris Ray. Uh, do you think Peace Corps needs to change its appeal to current 20 to 30 year olds, especially thinking about kids graduating from college with so much student debt these days? In the past, we've gone from the toughest job you'll ever love to how far will you go? Actually, I love that question. I want to add on to it as well. Also, when we're thinking about generational shifts, right? I, you know, whether, um, how are you going to appeal to Gen Z um, as opposed to marketing for millennials or, you know, the Gen Xers. So just thinking about it is that as well, but it's a fantastic question. And any of you can jump in who wants to answer it. Can you repeat the question? So this is talking about uh, like Peace Corps messaging to 20 to 30 year olds um, and just how to, how to appeal to them. Well, this is something I've been thinking about a lot. Um, I don't have an exact answer, but I think there does need to be a pivot. I think that much is, is clear. I think also there was always this look at um, people coming directly out of college, even though that's not as, even necessarily the majority of people who serve, but I know that was something that was always felt like super focusing. And I was one of those people, so. <laughs> but that being said, I think your service can be so much, I would say more valuable. It, 
valuable in a different way doing it later on. And then so A, just having more communication to, you know, that mid-career or, you know, early late career professional and near 30s and things like that. But again, noticing the value shift with millennials and Gen Z. Like, I'm not Gen Z, so I can't speak to their, to their values, but, but I think acknowledging things like the sacrifice to student debt that most of my generation has, also creating mechanisms that make it um, easier for people of diverse backgrounds to um, a diverse financial backgrounds to be able to volunteer because really it has become a thing where you are um, have to be a lot of times of a certain background in order to serve and make that sacrifice. So I think both changing the conversation but also changing the support mechanisms for people who do want to serve are a way to, to address that. Evie or Matt, do you all want to add to that? I think that was well put. Yeah, I think that was really well put. Um, I guess the only thing I would add is that um, I think really it's it's more about messaging. And um, I think if the Peace Corps brand can find a way to tie its messaging uh, into this, this tar target demographic in a way that authentically resonates with them, then I think you're going to engage people. Um, I mean, it's it's marketing in a sense, right? And, and how you frame that message is gonna look different for different demographics and, and obviously different generations. So, I mean, yeah, I think that there's some programs or supports that, um, you know, can incentivize them. I, I think I saw in the chat, like free college tuition or, or, or removal of debt. Like I'm sure that would definitely motivate people. Um, but I think at the end of the day, it's, it's telling a compelling story and, there, and the reasons why. Evie, do you wanna add something real quick? I think the toughest job you'll ever love is probably one of the best like concepts of Peace Corps because it's especially when you ha are having like those really rough days when you just don't think you're getting anything done or you're not really making a shift but then it's just and if anyone ever has like those moments of just like terminating early and saying forget it let me just go home like just toughest job you'll ever love do you really want to be here do you really you know want to support the community that you came to serve. And I, I think like reminding that is really um, beneficial. But, and then the other part of that was, um, you know, framing a message of how far will you go? I, I think that would be a really beneficial message to kind of start to challenge people to think like, how much are you willing to sacrifice? Because I, I think something that does get lost in the process and everything is like, it is a huge sacrifice, not just you, you know, getting up and leaving for two years, but you're going to be challenged all the time. If you're in a country with a totally different culture where certain aspects of your identity, you know, can, are safety concern, are you willing to, you know, hide those parts of yourselves to keep yourself safe? How much are you willing to compromise? And not necessarily like change who you are, but you know, just, you might have to really hide pieces of yourself to get the job done and, you know, to stay safe. And I think some people are willing to do that and others aren't, and both are okay. But I think that is a question that a lot of people should wrestle with and really reflect on before they decide, you know, is Peace Corps for me? Because I think with everyone's experience is something that always kind of comes back is whether or not someone, you know, leaves their service early, that was a community that was placed with a volunteer that needed them. Peace Corps is in places because they want volunteers to there, be there to support and stuff. And it's really important, you know, just before anyone has to go through a super traumatic experience, if it can be prevented by making sure there is that intrinsic reflection beforehand, I think it's really important to encourage that at every step of the process. Oh, Evie, that's so nice. I agree with that. A constant reflection. And I would also add, it's the toughest job you'll ever love. You might not love it every day, but over time, you'll love it. So we have, I think, three minutes. You have a minute, 30 seconds to answer, considering all three goals of the Peace Corps, in your opinion, what has been Peace Corps' biggest impact? We can mix it up. We'll start with Matthew this time, because he's been the third. And then we'll go Gwen and then Evie, and then we'll wrap it up for the next panel. Um, I think the impact, honestly, I think the biggest impact uh, with in Peace Corps has to do with um, the one-to-one -one exchange of stories. Um, 
I mean, personally, I studied film in my undergrad, and, and I, I honestly believe stories have the capacity to build ties across cultures and expand, you know, our minds. And I, I think that's exactly what happened to me when I was there. And, you know, while I think the projects and skills that volunteers engage in um, can have impact, um, it's those shared experiences with the communities that we co-create that I honestly, honestly think sustain for the rest of our lives, right? Like, I'm going to have that story for the rest of my life. So I, I think that's an invaluable thing um, that could be applied to across various industries, um, professional careers, personal lives, is having that story, that understanding of, of a broader world, so. Matthew, thank you so much. I love that, stories. Gwen? Well, Matthew stole some of the words out of my mouth, but uh, I, I would say uh, it's really practicing soft diplomacy. It's those connections between people, the goals to, you know, goals two and three, really. I think, you know, for some people, it's people are cute, so I'm trying to be this um, international development vehicle. And I really don't see it as I, I, I do think that, yes, there are some great projects and, and skills that are, that are transferred. And, and, but I think that that focus needs to be reframed. I really think that the lasting sustainable change comes from these cross-cultural connections. And I'm always going to be a big advocate of things happening in Macedonia, a little teeny tiny country in the Balkans that no one even knows exists. Um, whereas, you know, I brought in a very different perspective in that community in Macedonia, and we still have conversations and exchange, you know, even years later. And I think that um, having that expanded worldview, both for Americans and for people of other countries, can only do really great things rather than, again, just kind of focusing on the hard skill exchange. Great. Thank you, Gwen. All right, Evie, you want to have the last word on this one? They both took the words out of my mouth. Yeah, like the um, that expanded worldview for everyone involved. I think, um, you know, Peace Corps is a wonderful opportunity for those who have the desire to serve and, you know, the opportunity to do it that they probably wouldn't otherwise have. Um, I honestly, I, I don't know if I would have been able to travel and move somewhere else for two years. Um, you know, like I'd probably be able to travel, but not an extended period of time like that to really immerse myself in another culture. And, you know, on the flip side, I came across so many people that I was still the first American that they've ever seen, but Peace Corps has been in St. Lucia, St. Lucia was one of the first countries to get volunteers. And there's, you know, still people that are coming across Americans for the first time. And I know like that's not the only country that had that interaction. So that, you know, that constant cross-cultural chance to have that diplomatic exchange. And it's it's amazing to see, you know, volunteers at such a the base level being ambassadors for the US and showcasing, you know, hopefully the best that America has to offer and just like in in the way people carry themselves and interact and care for others. And to see that on the flip side for their host countries and how host countries look out for one another. And there might be this lens of third world countries, but there's so much richness in a culture that people probably wouldn't see if it wasn't for Peace Corps volunteers and host countries coming together to have these interactions. Great, thank you so much, Evie. Thank you all so much. You have kicked off our symposium here Peace Corps 2.0, our panel of student voices. Give you all a round of applause. Thank you all so much for your heartfelt um, thoughts and reflections and conversation. And I will turn it back over to our moderator. Great, thank you. Wow, what a great panel we had. What great conversation. I couldn't keep my eyes off of the chat and wanted to answer those questions myself. Uh, I saw in the chat that Anita noted that there is a um, a, mo a documentary, and that was one of the things I was going to say. Uh, first, I'd like to say uh, to Maureen, I'd love to have a conversation with you about the chocolatey, sugary puff cereals in the <laughs> in the aisles. Uh, we anyone who would uh, like to talk about. Um, or talk to the people who have recently returned, um, the students, check out the Student Voices video, which is part of the 60th anniversary. One other thing is, Matthew, you did hit it on the head for the Museum of the Peace Corps Experience. We're all about telling the stories and passing that on. About the, about the documentary, um, Alana DeJoseph, who is a returned Peace Corps volunteer, produced a towering task. And, um, 
you can check the chat again for more information. If you haven't seen it, it's great. And you can see it a whole lot more times than once to really in, get so much out of it. There is a um, website that you can go to as well. The second panel today gathers three RPCVs or Return Peace Corps volunteers representing non-majority populations in the United States. They too reflect candidly on their experiences, particularly as members of an underrepresented population who may not have matched expectations of host countries. We're pleased to introduce our moderator, Jermaine Griffin, who served in El Salvador from 2005 to 2007. Doc, Dr. Griffin is now project manager for Panama Teach, a program within the School of Education at American University. He will introduce our three panelists and moderate the Q&A. Jermaine, take it away. Thank you so much, Pat. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be a part of the 60th uh, anniversary celebration. Uh, I am so delighted to be able to be a part of what is, I believe, a very outstanding panel and to introduce three fabulous, fabulous panelists whose stories and experiences are a microcosm of the complexity and vibrancy of our country's diversity that we are so privileged to share with the world through the Peace Corps. And so without further delay, I will introduce our speakers. First, we have Tarshay Collins, who is originally from Northwest Indiana and currently based in Seattle, Washington, working as an economic development specialist with the Department of Commerce. Tarshe served in three different placements, first in Honduras from 2007 to 2009, then the Philippines from 2016 to 2018, and most recently in Peru from 2018 to 2020. Next, we'll hear from Charles Inciso, uh, whose hometown is, I'm sorry, Charles Inciso, uh, whose hometown is San Diego. Charles's Peace Corps journey included Tonga for three years from 1994 to 1997, and then several years at Peace Corps headquarters from 1997 to 2002, including five years as staff in the Philippines and Nepal. Charles was also country director in Armenia from 2014 to 2017. Charles is currently the Volunteer Services Director for the San Diego LGBT Community Center. And our third outstanding panelist will be Katrina Mathis, who is originally from Atlanta and currently resides in DC. Katrina is the Volunteer Services Director at Food and Friends, which is based in DC. Katrina's Peace Corps service includes two years in Guinea from 1994 to 1996, and several years as a Peace Corps recruiter from 1997 to 2002. Our panel will spend the next 20 minutes or so reflecting on their experiences. And they have quite a bit to share and we are so in gratitude for this opportunity. So I will, get, uh, I will turn it over to uh, Tarshte to start our conversation. Hi, <laughs> good afternoon everyone. I wanted to reflect on um, some of the things that um, Peace Corps, my take on the overall um, benefit of Peace Corps, which um, to me is the legacy that the Peace Corps brings to the communities they serve in. In my experience in the Philippines, which was the most difficult, they assumed they were getting a white volunteer and they were very taken aback and um, I faced some opposition as I was trying to engage and integrate into the communities and um, also with my counterpart, which was very hard. It was very hard because the living situation was kind of awkward as well as my working situation, which almost had me thinking like um, I'm sacrificing, you know, time and, you know, and opportunities to, you know, gain, you know, work and, you know, being in a situation where it's unfamiliar 
for being for me not to be accepted. But it was very difficult for me to make a decision to stay and to continue my service. But I had to really think about myself and what I'm there for and engaging and really teaching people the culture of the United States is just not just white Americans. It is very diverse. And I wanted to be that instrument and I wanted to um, be able to allow people to ask questions about, about Black Americans and be allowed to touch my hair, of course, my long locks, um, being allowed, you know, just allowed just to be curious about Black Americans and open the door in conversation for inclusion. When I was in Peru, um, I heard about a story by two volunteers who were in the indigenous community, and they were a, they had a young guy, a young little boy in the house that they stayed in, and this young boy his name was Alejandro Toledo. They were very supportive of this young man. They thought they saw something very promising in him. And so they ended up helping him support him through his studies. He was able to get a scholarship to the University of San Francisco. And lo and behold, even though the Peace Corps in Peru was closed from in 1975 due to political unrest, when he returned back to his community after fighting for the indigenous community in Peru, he ended up running for president and actually winning the presidency and became the president of Peru. And in 2001, he just couldn't believe the Peace Corps was not involved in how beneficial it was to communities. He reinstated, he re-invited Peace Corps to come back to Peru. And so it's been in Peru since two. This story really resonated with me because it shows the definite impact that Peace Corps has in, in communities abroad and how the legacy continues on when volunteers return to different sites. It, it looks as if we're having some technical difficulties, uh, but we really, we really appreciate uh, Tarshe sharing her experiences. Thank you very much, Tarshe. Uh, we really appreciate you sharing uh, part of your amazing journey in the Peace Corps and three different uh, sites. Um, we really appreciate you sharing. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your sacrifice. I would like now to give uh, Charles an opportunity to share um, a few moments and perspective from his experiences. All right, thank you, Tremaine. Um, once again, my name is Charles. My pronouns are he, him. I am from San Diego, I'm Filipino American. Uh, and I served in Tonga in the South Pacific in the mid 1990s when Peace Corps was really just starting to consistently include diversity training in, it, in its Peace Corps training design, um, though it wasn't yet included in mine. We didn't have a single session actually about diversity during my training, uh, which is probably why um, when I first arrived in Tonga, two volunteers of color who were serving at the time took it upon themselves to pull me aside and to give me a heads up that I might have uh, difficult experiences in Peace Corps because of my ethnicity. Um, I remember listening to them and thanking them and then just completely forgetting about what they told me until a few days later when they were pairing us all up with our host families. Uh, and it became very clear to me the disappointment in the eyes of my host family when they were matched with the one brown volunteer in, in my group. Um, and I remember thinking, oh, this must be what those volunteers were talking about. Um, and I realized in that moment that, you know, those two volunteers had something very, really important to, to share and that, that I wasn't getting from Peace Corps and, and that it would be wise for me to listen and to learn uh, and to commit to paying it forward to any uh, diverse volunteers who came after me. Uh, and in the end, you know, their advice came in very useful. You know, fast forward to, you know, post swearing in and uh, I'm at my site, which I loved. Uh, with the exception of the fact that uh, every morning I had to walk by an elementary school 
Um, and every morning, hundreds of kids would come running to the fence and they would scream, Siapani, Siapani at me, which is Tongan for Japanese person, right? Uh, and again, I'm not Japanese, but you know, I was prepared for this. The, those volunteers had shared that Asian uh, American uh, Peace Corps volunteers were commonly and frequently misidentified. And the default was often Japanese because of the large contingent of foreign volunteers from Japan that were active in Tonga. Um, so, you know, uh, like many volunteers of color, I took this as my goal to opportunity to educate about the fact that not all US Americans are white. Um, I would explain to them in Tongan that I'm American. My parents were originally from the Philippines. Uh, but after weeks of this, it was clear that it wasn't sinking in. I, you know, there were some days when I, I just ignored the kids. Um, I remembered around four months into this, I remember screaming expletives at the children because I was so frustrated. Not one of my best moments as a Peace Corps volunteer. Um, and then I remember around you know, month six, as I was preparing you know, for what felt like the 500th time uh, you know, to, ex to go through my spiel, um, I see one kid elbow the kid next to him and say, oh, in Tongan, uh, he's not Japanese, he's actually American. Um, I think I may have cried a little bit when, when that happened. It was such a, a seminal moment in, in my Peace Corps experience. Um, you know, being misidentified, being devalued, or other forms of discrimination happen a lot to volunteers of color. Um, but I, I also want to emphasize that while my diversity absolutely had an impact on my volunteer experience, my cultural background uh, and the coping skills that I had developed growing up in, in the United States, I think were also value added. Um, in many ways, I think they prepared me for my Peace Corps experience. And and they set me up for success. Um, I remember one point, for example, I was walking down the street with uh, my white volunteer friend and he started complaining to me about how he always hated being stared at. You know, And I remember realizing that I hadn't even noticed that we were being stared at. Um, as a person of color, I think I was used to being watched a little more closely or even followed right? when, when I walked through certain stores. Um, and so ignoring that negative attention was uh, a coping mechanism that I had developed at home and actually brought with me to my Peace Corps experience. Um, I believe the Peace Corps now is actually much better at both preparing and supporting diverse volunteers than, than Peace Corps was when I was a volunteer. Um, though it does concern me listening to some of Evie's um, comments and because and, you know she's a very recent volunteer and, and still had a lot of the same um, um, experiences that, that I did. Um, though, you know, I think my close association with Peace Corps, which spans, you know, two decades, starting as a volunteer, becoming staff in headquarters, and then staff at post in, in, three, different, in three different countries, you know, I was involved in a lot of those changes and improvements, but I, I, again, I think there is room for improvement, and there's always room for improvement, right? Um, I think in regards to intersectionality, equity, representation, these are areas in which I think Peace Corps can still improve. Uh, in regards specifically to intersectionality, um, our diversity isn't just our ethnic backgrounds, right? It's, it's our, our genders and our ages and our sexualities. And, and um, my experience, for example, as a cis, gay, Asian male was very different from my best friend's experience as a cis, straight, Asian female. Um, and because of my intersectionality, I think in some ways my experience was easier and in some ways it was more difficult than hers. Um, I think the Peace Corps could really improve the consideration of both intersectionality and equity uh, in kind of how Peace Corps allocates time and resources in supporting diverse volunteers. And in regards to representation, you know, Peace Corps staff are still predominantly cis, straight, and white, and there needs to be more representation, particularly in high-level leadership positions at Peace Corps, to effectively implement some necessary systemic changes that would make the experiences uh, a more positive one for our diverse volunteers and our diverse staff. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to continuing this conversation after this. Thank you so much, Charles. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your example. And thank you for letting us share a little bit of your journey. Um, we really appreciate it. And, and now we will hear from our third outstanding uh, panelist. Um, at this time, we will hear from Katrina. Oh, 
Okay, thank you so much. Thanks, Jermaine. Thanks, Charles and Tarche. Um, what I would just like to share is, first of all, I was a volunteer again in Guinea, West Africa from 94 to 96. I was a health volunteer. It was one of the best experiences or decisions I made and two of the best years of my life. Uh, some of the best people I've ever met before uh, I served with in the Peace Corps, some of my closest friends still to this day. What I'd like to focus on is just that I believe there's a whole lot that Peace Corps gets right. Uh, but like Charles said, there's so many things that Peace Corps can improve upon. And I think that this is a great time as we are really reflecting and, and pulling back the curtain on so many processes and systems and things that do and don't work in, in our country and globally. This is a great time for us to be really renegotiating and reimagining and rethinking you know, how we do things. And so I think Peace Corps' greatest asset are the boots on the ground. The, the ground game for Peace Corps, volunteers in communities, steeped in these communities for two years, learning the culture and the language and, and, uh, and, and providing skilled labor, which is what you know the first mission is all about. I, that's, that's our advantage and that's where we need to stay and we do that well. Just an example of that is when I first arrived at site, uh, Italians came in and they were doing something with them. They put in this great water something where we didn't have to use a well and I didn't have to filter water and it was great. What I immediately noticed was they were there for about four to six hours that day. And then they got in the SUV and they left. And that's when I got it that they've provided service. Lots of other expats provide service to these different countries, but we are the boots on the ground. We are there and we are integrated into these communities. And it is it's a transformative experience for us. And I believe that it can be for the people with whom we connect locally as well. So that's what Peace Corps gets right. And um, among other things, but for me, I could say I was invited to my first Seder in Peace Corps. I met my first Orthodox uh, Jewish friend in Peace Corps. We sat in her house. She made kosher food. And then I was looking at pictures of her holding an Uzi while she was serving in the Israeli army. I, like, I didn't know anything about that until before I met her. My first Latina friends were in the Peace Corps. I met my first Haitian American in the Peace Corps. And so for me, Peace Corps was was in addition to, it's kind of like doing your primary and your secondary project. Um, that was something that I think we started post the 60s, 70s maybe. Um, and it, it was, it was um, an opportunity to have a window into the host country nationals, but I learned a lot about Americans, other Americans. And I think that's very important. And I think that's some, a component of training that is missing and could be improved upon simply because there were things, there were insensitivities, there were microaggressions, things that I don't think were intentional for other Americans. But <clears throat> there was a guy in my group who always needed to tell me how ugly the women in Guinea were, always needed to tell me that. You can have your preferences in the first two or three times, that's fine. Okay, you don't find these women attractive, that's fine. But to constantly tell me that every time you see me is a problem. So when I recounted with, so do you think you look like Denzel Washington? And the volunteer said, uh, well, no. And I said, so let me tell you this. Let me help you see it this way. I look like these women. So when you call them ugly, you're talking about me and I'm not ugly, not even close to it. So let's stop that. And had we had some training around those things, around um, calling, you know, French in Guinea, the, the French, we, we were with a, a French, a white French speaker from another country, and a volunteer said, oh, that's real French. Well, we were speaking French. And if we could have just gone through in training and talked about why people do and don't think that, because that's not real. If you understand anything about how the French, you know, really oversee their language, that's not true. And there were just microaggressions and aggressions here and there that I think we could have done better with had we had some training in that. I would also like to say that when I came home, I was a return volunteer. I mean, I'm sorry, I was a staff person. And um, when I came home, I was told about um, the, the, the role that I had advanced to was recruitment coordinator in the Atlanta office. 
And I was told by someone at Peace Corps DC that the only time a black person advances to that role is if there is a black hiring manager. And that was very disheartening for me, given that at the time, Peace Corps uh, staff was about, um, I would say 80% domestically. They were return volunteers, 80% of them were return volunteers. So I'm thinking we've gone overseas, we've had these cross cultural experiences. I mean, these deeply entrenched cross cultural experiences and we come home and we do the same things, you know? And, and that was just disheartening. And I remember uh, one of the people who was exiting, Charles, I don't remember the name of this title, APCD, Associate Peace Corps Director. One of them said to me as I was having my exit interview, if you want to stay in the international world, don't go home and get around your friends. If you go back and get around your old friends, you're gonna go and do your old things. You are gonna have to stay around your Peace Corps friends and people who have the same mindset. And so that's my challenge to Peace Corps as we move forward, that Peace Corps is the start of a continuum of service because we have a lot of challenges here in the country that we need to address around race, around cross-cultural sensitivities, insensitivities, anti-racism and the lot. And Peace Corps volunteers are well-equipped you know, to, to come in and be able to do that. And then I also feel that Peace Corps can do better with, as Charles you know, originally pointed out, with the staff that it hires, with its leadership, with people that it puts in those positions, simply because if you want to have diversity, you've got to be able to support these people. And it's not okay, you know, to know that, oh, the only time this is going to happen, these Black people are never going to advance to this unless you have people who look like them in those roles, then either put people like who look like them in those roles or challenge the people who don't look like them in those roles to actually um, um, use the skill sets that they acquired, those muscles that they developed as Peace Corps volunteers to do some things differently. You know, I just believe that Peace Corps volunteers are great people. And so we, we don't wanna do what we've always done. We wanna build upon these foundations. You know, we want to see Peace Corps grow as it has grown, but it's time for more growth. Thank you so much, Katrina. Uh, thank you for your service. And thank you for challenging all of us to reflect on the past, appreciate it, and then learn from it so that we can do better as a community, uh, as a world. And so with that, I'd like to uh, I once again thank all three of our outstanding uh, panelists for sharing their perspectives uh, today. And we want to continue the conversation uh, by transitioning to a brief poll um, that you should be seeing momentarily. And this is just to see if we can make some additional connections to people's experiences if they were, uh, whether or not they were Peace Corps volunteers. And so the question is, did discrimination factor into your Peace Corps experience? You can see the, the options there below. Um, and it looks like responses are coming in rather quickly. But as those responses are coming in, um, I wanted to pivot back to our panelists just to get their initial snap reactions to what, what they may be seeing. As of right now, we have um, about 13% of re responders um, experience discrimination directly as Peace Corps volunteers. 28% uh, witness discrimination during their Peace Corps service. And another 29% both experienced and witnessed discrimination. Uh, and 20% uh, were not aware of any discrimination. And uh, kudos uh, to those 10% that have not yet served. Um, as mentioned earlier, uh, we definitely welcome your, your interest and, and hope that you'll, you'll join the Peace Corps community as volunteers in the future. So with that, um, would anyone like to maybe just briefly just weigh in on, on, those, on the, the, that snapshot reaction to the poll? Oh. Charles, I think you're sure. Sure, it looks like Katrina was was pointing at me like like she wanted me to answer. Um, 
You know, I, as I was saying in, in my comments, I feel like every volunteer experiences experiences some form of, of discrimination. And, and I think the um, maybe the severity of it, again, is dependent on, on who we are, right? And, and our compositions is, again, when I was talking about intersectionality and, and, and you know, um, I saw a mention of that again in, in some of the comments. I think that you can you can create kind of a, a generally a, a hierarchical scale, right, of people's experiences where, you know, a, a cis, straight, white, older male is going to be somewhere near the top, you know, and then a uh, non-binary, black, young woman is going to be, you know, somewhere near the bottom as far as kind of the, the impact of, of some of these experiences. Um, and so, so I, I feel like, you know, many PCVs are going to experience some sort of discrimination in their service. And I think the most important thing to consider in this, though, is how people prepare the individuals, volunteers, uh, for those experiences that are invariably going to happen to them. And how does the Peace Corps support the individuals that, that it's happening to? Because, you know, we can only influence so much as, as staff and, and volunteers abroad. Um, but what we can influence is, is are those two things, how we prepare and how we support those volunteers. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Charles. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if Tarche or Katrina, would you like to add anything to what Charles? I would like to add, um, thanks Charles for that. I would just like to say as a Peace Corps volunteer, um, I did not, ex I did experience some minor discrimination, uh, but what I have to say to, uh, the reason why I, I don't feel like I did was be a whole lot was because I was, I'm a black person and I was serving in Sub-Saharan Africa, which is black Africa. So I was around a lot of black, I was around black people, I was in black countries, and I happened to be in a black country that loved its blackness. They were poor people, but they were very much empowered, and they embraced me. So I, you know, when I hear different stories about, especially uh, volunteers of color, like what Tarche and Charles talked about with some of their experiences, um, I got the same thing Charles got. I would walk down the street and I would get two babu, Porto, and that's basically they're like, hey, white girl, hey, white girl, hey, white person. And I'm not white, but being over there, you know, then you learn that you're seen as white. You're told that you have a white mentality, you, you know, um, and I've been wanting all my life to get to Africa to, to meet the black people. And they didn't even, I wasn't black enough. So, and, and I'm not even talking about my hue as much as, you know, I'm an American and, and being an American meant white. But what I will say is that um, most of the, the, the discrimination and I would say outright patterns of racism that I saw, and it was very disappointing. Like I said, let me preface this. Some of the best people I've ever met were Peace Corps volunteers. This is not all return volunteers. But I saw when I came home in the workplace from RPCVs. And it was very disheartening, um, just patterns of racism and different things. And I made, I learned a lot because I made assumptions about who return volunteers are because it was a transformative experience for me. And I get we can't help where we're from. We always have to be working on improving and, and changing those tapes. And, you know, you grow up, you just, you learn different things. But I did expect different behaviors um, from from return volunteers that I didn't always see. And so um, to, to some of the things that, that Charles spoke about and that I'm speaking about, um, you know, I would like to see Peace Corps, um, you know, hire more diverse staff, especially um, in its leadership ranks, but then also hold people accountable you know, um, with regard to monitoring and evaluation and screening and all of those different things, uh, simply because we're, we're in a new age, you know, and, and we have got, and Peace Corps has adapted well to the changes. I remember when I was a volunteer and, you know, I had to wait six to eight weeks to get postal mail. Volunteers don't have to do that anymore. They have the internet. And, and while the examples aren't exactly the same, the, ad, the adaptations have to take place and they are taking place. Uh, we're in this time of, again, uh, racial reckoning and and just looking at everything across the board. Peace Corps has a lot of work to do. The good part is Peace Corps is open to doing it. You know, I've been reading what the MPCA uh, publishes. So um, that was my experience. 
If anyone would like to, to ask a question, please uh, drop your question in the chat. And I, I believe uh, some have already done so. And uh, I will, at this time, turn it over to Ali to, to help us facilitate some of those questions. If Hello. So um, we probably don't have a lot of time here, but, um, you know, there's been a lot of people who've been sharing their experiences and, you know, similarities that they felt with um, what our panelists have spoken about. Um, some people were talking about, there was another woman, Mary Owen Thomas, who is also Filipino American, said that she served in the Philippines too, and where everybody lamented that they didn't get a real American. So, you know, it sounds like that's um, an idea that really resonated with a lot of people. If anyone wants to, to, to comment on that. Can I, can I say to that, um, you know, Charles has spoke up, spoke to that. I had an, um, uh, there was a Vietnamese American a friend I had in the Peace Corps, uh, Rosette, and she had me go out with her. She said, I want you to come out and walk with me and I want you to hear what I hear. And so I went out and I walked with her and the kids, while, she, while we were walking together, I'm laughing because I laughed at her face when it happened. They would say, hing hong, hing hong, chop, chop, Bruce Lee, chop, chop, Bruce Lee. Okay, now, and I said, I, I know that gets on your nerve, but every black man that they saw, Mike Tyson, Mike Tyson, they, it, it was, that was what kids did. They watched a lot of martial arts. Uh, they loved Kung Fu. They loved all of it. And that's what they did. And we all dealt with that to a degree. We all did. However, I also dealt with it, a black person. And I'm thinking, we talked about slavery. When the mother of my family, when I got there, she came to me all oh, forlorn and she she said, we are so sorry about slavery. I was like, oh, lady, please, we're good. We're totally good. Don't worry about it. But when we were talking one day, um, I was sitting next to a white volunteer. Somebody came up and they said, who are these two people? And the woman pointed to me and she said, oh, she's an American. Then she pointed to the white volunteer and she said, Oroko Americanjo, tiggy, 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 tiggy. Well, tiggy, tiggy, tiggy means for real, really, 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 this white person is a real American. This black person, you're an American, but you're not a real American. So the only people who are truly American are white people. And I learned that in the Peace Corps, but as Charles said, it was an opportunity for education. You know, I mean, cause you had to, I mean, you stay pissed off the whole time if you stay pissed off about every single aggression or microaggression that, that happened while you were serving. And I would just add, and, and Katrina's brought this up a few times, you know, the role that, that your fellow Peace Corps volunteers play in, in that support um, when, when things like that do happen to you, right? I think when volunteers will go to their peers for support before they'll go to, to, to the staff. And um, I, I think, you know, those peers need to be prepared to provide support that those volunteers need. You know what I mean? And so uh, when somebody's being misidentified uh, or, or devalued, you know, because they're not considered a, a real American, um, the their, their fellow Peace Corps volunteers need to understand that, need to understand where that's coming from, right? Need to, need to you know, acknowledge that that volunteer they're sitting next to is having a very, very different experience from, from their own uh, and, and need to be uh, prepared and, and ready to provide whatever support that person needs. And uh, in my experience, you know, volunteers just weren't because those kinds of conversations weren't happening. You know what I mean? This conversation that we're having right now wasn't happening at, at our at, at our post. And so when I was in a position to to, you know, make sure that these conversations would happen, and I, I absolutely did do that. Thank you uh, very much, Charles and Katrina, for for your reflections on on, on the great question, one of many great questions uh, from our audience. Um, and thank you, Ali, for facilitating uh, the Q&A. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, we, don't have, uh, we don't have the wealth of time to, to really get into a, a lot of great, potentially great conversations. Um, so we will ask uh, our, 
outstanding panel to, to reflect on this final question uh, with each taking uh, just a few sentences uh, to respond to this third question. And, and, and that is uh, considering all three goals of Peace Corps, in your opinion, what is Peace Corps biggest single impact? And for this round, if we could start with Katrina and then move to Charles and finally Tarche, um, that would be fantastic. Okay, thanks again for allowing me to be here and thanks so much for all the comments in the chat. I will say that Peace Corps biggest impact, I go back to the boots on the ground, but because of that, it is the, because of that two year experience being entrenched, it is the intellectual development of the Peace Corps volunteer who comes home and they are better because of it and they make everything they do better simply because this is a lived experience and we take it everywhere we go and we integrate it into everything that we do. So I would say it's the intellectual development of the Peace Corps volunteer who brings that back home. All right. Um, my response is, is, is going to be very, very similar to Katrina's. I mean, I, when I think about uh, Peace Corps' single biggest impact, I, I think that that's the return Peace Corps volunteer, you know? I, uh, and, and Peace Corps really doesn't, doesn't tout that enough, the impact that the experience has on the, our, the return Peace Corps volunteer and what those individuals do when they come back to the United States. You know, I, I have both experienced it myself and witnessed it in so many others, you know, the transformative and empowering experience that Peace Corps is. Uh, and it's my very sincere and earnest hope that, you know, these volunteers will return to the United States and they will influence change Will improve, they'll work to improve our society. Um, and, you know, and in particular, those BIPOC return Peace Corps volunteers, um, you know, be the leaders that, that the experience uh, helped you become, work for the agency and, and, and improve the Peace Corps. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Charles and Katrina. Uh, Tarshay, are, are, you, are, you, are you there? Hi, this is this is Pat, uh, Jermaine, and I see Tarjay is still with us. And if she speaks, it just takes herself off off mute. We might be able to hear her clearly enough. Okay, great. Oh, she may be having a an audio problem on her side, even hearing us. So I, I'm afraid that with the time marching on, uh, we're not going to be able to. Um, uh, to hear from Tarjay, I really very sincerely ap uh, apologize for this. We've all missed out. I have heard Tarjay, and she's a terrific, uh, reflective storyteller and, and uh, has a lot of personal experiences. In fact, I'm going to urge you to go to the Many Faces of Peace Corps video, uh, which I think it's the uh, uh, link is going to be on your in the chat. And, and here, Tarjay, uh, but um, before I before we move on, uh, Jermaine, I, I took over the, the your moderator's role. What do you, would you like to say some final uh, things to the panelists and the attendees? Yes, yes. Um, I just would like to say thank you. Thank you, uh, not only to our panelists and, and uh, moderators, but for to many of our guests, thank you all for your service. Thank you for your interest in the Peace Corps, what the Peace Corps does, uh, but specifically to our panelists, thank you for the generosity of time and space that you've allowed for us to learn more about the many perspectives and faces of Peace Corps through your lenses. And we hope that uh, this will add to increased understanding of what Peace Corps is and what it could be. And so I, I'm just delighted to have that opportunity and I echo Pat's sentiments. Uh, we, we, we did indeed miss out, we missed out because of technology. Uh, we could not hear more from Tarche, but please uh, go to the link that's been placed in the chat to hear more of Tarche's story as well as other outstanding stories at the uh, Many Faces of Peace Corps video. Um, I will also, place a, a link in the chat box to visit 
the uh, Peace Corps at 60 uh, Inside the Volunteer Virtual Exhibition. Um, we hope that you will take advantage of, if you haven't already, of both of these treasures. And with that, I will um, humbly turn it back over to Pat. Okay, Jermaine, thank you so much. And to the panelists, it was great. You brought a lot of information and reflection for our reflection. So great contributors, all of you. And I hope uh, all of you catch Tarche in the video. This final segment of the symposium is framed differently than the last two. We're linking the 1961 foundations of Peace Corps to this, its 60th anniversary. First, we're going to hear some stories from two volunteers who attended that conference in March of 1961, when 500 students gathered at American University to advise Sergeant Shriver about the basic foundations of Peace Corps. Moving from these stories, we focus on highlights of Peace Corps Connect to the Future, a report of recommendations compiled by the National Peace Corps Association in 2020, just after the uh, pandemic began and after and during the racial unrest that we all are experiencing began again. We move then into breakout rooms where you will discuss the impact of Peace Corps. Finally, you'll get to talk to one another almost face to face in a wonderful device called breakout rooms. We'll tell you about them in a few minutes. And then to bring closure to the symposium, we'll hear from a representative of Peace Corps headquarters who will update us on the agency itself. And now for the storytelling, it gives me great pleasure to introduce two people who as students attended that conference 60 years ago, actually today was the, the that, that um, conference went from March 29th to March 31st, 1961. Today is the exact anniversary of the closing of that conference. I'm pleased to introduce first Judith Madden Sturgis, who was an undergraduate student at University of Michigan in 1960. She served as a volunteer in Cusco, Peru from 1964 to 1966, working in community development with weavers and wood carvers. Judith is a member of the Committee for a Museum of the Peace Corps Experience. Our second 1961 conference attendee is Daryl Young, Columbia One, 1961 to 1963. Columbia One was the first group to begin Peace Corps training on June 25th, 1961 at Rutgers University in New Jersey. Daryl is now retired from the University of Texas, Austin, Department of Economics and the Institute for Latin American Studies. Daryl will also moderate this final segment of the symposium. So after stories, of his conference attendance, he will change hats from storyteller to moderator. Thank you, Daryl. And now right. Judith, Judith Madden Sturgis will tell us her stories. I was on the steps of the University of Michigan Union when Senator Jack Kennedy came out the front door to speak to thousands of students and faculty that cold night in October, 1960. It was my sophomore year at Michigan and I had been waiting with my dorm friend, Linda, for more than five hours. As the hours went by and brief rain showers in the cold began to penetrate our coats as the dorm curfews expired, some students were forced to leave. Linda and I had slowly moved forward until we were standing on the lower stairs about 20 feet away to the left of the speaker podium. Several hours later, close to 2 a.m., we were told that Jack Kennedy had arrived at the Union and would speak to us shortly. The crowd began pressing forward and we were squeezed ever, even closer, my feet barely touching the stairs. My friend Linda tripped and fell amongst the legs. Her high-pitched calls for help could hardly be heard. Finally, Linda reappeared with the help of many outreach hands just as Senator Kennedy came through the Michigan Union doorway. The TV camera's lights burned our eyes as they saw Kennedy's figure moving towards the podium. 
He was surrounded by a group of men who were probably his staff and no doubt secret service people that I would learn to recognize in the coming years. Jack's smiling face and reddish hair became our focus under the bright lights as he began to speak. The pushing had stopped and the total silence of the large crowd had filled the air as we became absorbed in the unique message he was about to give us, a message spoken only at that moment in time, but heard by many generations of people everywhere, both in America and abroad, in developed and undeveloped countries around the world. How many of you are going to be doctors and are willing to spend your days in Ghana? How many are willing to give service to your country by traveling abroad? Tom Hayden, who in 1960 was editor of the Michigan Daily and a well-known figure on campus would say 50 years later at the Peace Corps reunion in Michigan, that there was a spontaneous reaction to Kennedy's speech like a spark that ignited not only a new government service called the Peace Corps, but a whole array of activism, which unfolded in the late 60s, including civil rights, voting rights, and the exceptionally large Vietnam anti-war movement. Since Kennedy's speech at Michigan, the Peace Corps has demonstrated how the power of an idea can capture the imagination of an entire nation. The idea ignited the students who made it a reality. Soon after Jack Kennedy's talk with us in Ann Arbor, we began to produce the working papers for a national conference on youth service abroad to be held at American University in Washington, D.C. on March 29th through 31st, 1961. We're inspired by Kennedy's new Peace Corps director, Sergeant Schreiber, who's, who asked us to give him suggestions as to what the Peace Corps would look like. The working papers became a 28 page document that offered debate topics for the conference. What would youth service look like? What countries, communities, or villages would invite American volunteers? Where and how would volunteers live? What projects would they work on and how long would they stay? How would they learn to speak the language of the host nation or community? So many questions to be answered. After the working papers had already been printed with the name Youth Service Abroad, Sergeant Schreiber called us with a name change to Peace Corps. Finally, after weeks of writing and copying, we were ready to go to American University. A small group of undergraduates crawled into a black hearse with the words Peace Corps painted in big white letters on its side. Peace Corps rather than Peace Corps would be appropriate as so many people had begun to say it would never happen. It would be dead on arrival. Congress would never approve or fund an independent Peace Corps. So off we went to Washington, D.C., Michigan's undergraduates, Tom Hayden, Jill, Jill Henningstein, myself, and our coordinator for the conference, Frank Starkweather. Hour after hour, we drove from Ann Arbor to American University. At the conference, our concern about Peace Corps became a reality that faded away, any concerns we had. The idea was alive and well. The large hall at American University was jammed with over 500 students. We came from universities large and small across the country. The excitement was heard in every corner of the room and hallways at AU. We were making a new world with our own independent government organization, Peace Corps. Probably the most important event I remember at the conference is the debate between Tom Hayden, representing the University of Michigan's political left, and a student from Barry Goldwater's followers, representing the conservative rights, Young Americans for Freedom. Tom and the Yas thought their issue would determine the success of the Peace Corps. The left thought the Peace Corps needed to be an independent agency. The right was determined to make the Peace Corps part of the U.S. State Department. In the end, Tom Hayden and his team won the day. The Peace Corps became an independent agency reporting directly to the president. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you, Judith. You were there right there at the moment of conception of Peace Corps. I mean, the coming yes. together of John Kennedy and the student activists, that was critical mass that allowed Peace Corps to come into being. So let me uh, see what I might be able to add to your wonderful comments there. Uh, the, uh, what I guess I need for y'all to do here is come with me now back to, uh, a time, a time when it was a privilege, I guess, to be young and American, 
But in a time of, of just a few short decades ago, and I guess what I'm really talking about is spring break 1961. So my story goes as, as follows here. Spring break 1961. We were just four typical embarrassment to the species, college males crammed into a Volkswagen Beetle, driving straight through from Texas to Washington, D.C. And we were headed for an enticing event uh, by the back in the day Confederation of Student Governments from colleges across the country, the National Student Association workshop on the brand spanking new Peace Corps. As we clicked off one Southern state after another and then another, we were somewhat tempted to be a right and head for Fort Lauderdale where the mating game was in full swing. But we were fascinated by President Kennedy. Transcendent charmer he, calling Americans beyond ourselves, urging us to relate to the world in ways reflecting our shared humanity. Uh, stirring parts of ourselves we never knew, even knew existed. We just had to ask not, so we stayed on the straight and narrow and made our way to our nation's capital. American University was impressive and welcoming. Some 500 plus attendees were put up in university dorm rooms and eight on campus. Programming was coordinated with Peace Corps, but run by National Student Association and American University. Divided into groups of 25 or so, days were filled with brainstorming exchanges in AU classrooms on topics of particular interest to those actually putting Peace Corps together. Sessions were sometimes boring, but more often lively and always infused with the feeling that what we were doing mattered. Topics included what qualities should Peace Corps volunteers have? How long should Peace Corps volunteers be asked to serve? And what parts of the world should Peace Corps volunteers serve? And what parts of a given country? And what kinds of work should Peace Corps volunteers be involved? What sort of living arrangements for Peace Corps volunteers? What sort of support needed for P PCBs in the field? What sort of support for Peace Corps volunteers upon completion of service? What size should Peace Corps be? The NSA and uh, AU group leaders led to the discussion, took notes and forwarded same to Peace Corps planners who wanted feedback on the above topics, particularly from a potentially prime recruiting cohort. The output from these sessions helped to shape Peace Corps at its most formative stage. These were important questions and they are important questions now. After three, day, uh, excuse me, after three days of work, there was a memorable party well into the last evening at the Shorm Hotel with food, drinks, and music. Before heading home, I picked up a Peace Corps application and once back in Texas, filled it out and sent it in. In early June, received a telegram from Sergeant Shriver inviting me to report to Rutgers University for training to go to Columbia. I immediately looked up Columbia on the map and RSVP'd in the affirmative. And that has made all the difference in my world. I will always honor the memory of JFK. If not for him, I never would have given myself over to strange people in a strange land and soon finding myself strangely at home. Having no Latin blood in me, I never would have discovered those parts of myself that are indeed Latin. I never would have realized what texture there is to life, what moments there are for our own making. I never would have known myself beyond myself. Let us move from uh, snapshots of a budding Peace Corps to a report gleaned during uh, the summer here of, of 2020. And here to tell us about the Peace Corps' connect to the future 
are two members of the National Peace Corps Association's Advisory Council who helped compile that report. So I'd like to introduce you here to Anna Krohn and give you some of her bona fides here, some bona fides. And that would say, Anna served in Dominican Republic as a Peace Corps volunteer 2017 to 2020. She is a member, as already noted, of the Peace Corps Connect to the Future Advisory Council and a graduate student in the COGOD School of Business and School of International Service at American University. Also proud to have with us, Stephen Saum served in the Ukraine, 1994 to 96. And he is now director of communications at NPCA and editor of the NPCA magazine, Worldview. So if we might, Anna, may we begin with you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me here today. As Daryl said, my name's Anna Crone and I served as a Spanish literacy volunteer from 2017 until 2019 in the Dominican Republic and then extended a third year as the Education Peace Corps Volunteer Leader in Santo Domingo um, and was evacuated back in March 2020 as well. Um, and so I just want to give a little more context about what that kind of process was. Um, being a volunteer leader puts you in a very unique position. You're a liaison between the senior staff at post um, and an integral part of welcoming new trainees into the country, preparing them, having them adapt to all those weird cultural things when you first arrived to country. For those of us in the Dominican Republic, it was eating a lot of starchy vivres, like yuca, plantains, and so forth, um, but also training them on the Ministry of Education's agenda. And so back at the beginning of March 2020, there were many questions regarding the coronavirus, but not many clear answers. Um, and at the Peace Corps office in the Dominican Republic, we were preparing to welcome 45 new youth and education trainees. Um, and as COVID-19 continued to flood the news, staff at POST had a discussion about what would happen if a new trainee coming into country contracted COVID-19 en route um, because coronavirus had been declared a pandemic, there was worry that the host government would quarantine any COVID-19 cases without Peace Corps medical officers having a say in the type of care a trainee or a volunteer would receive. Um, and as many of you probably remember, there's a lot of information, but we weren't really sure, you know, what are the symptoms of coronavirus? And we still don't always know what are, you know, the lasting impacts. Um, and so, out of an abundance of caution, the post along with headquarters made the difficult decision to postpone that incoming cohort until we had a clear contingency plan. And as March progressed, um, Peace Corps continued to put into place more travel restrictions about whether or not we could go back to the US just to you know, really prevent the spread of coronavirus. There were very few cases in the Dominican Republic at that time. There was no discussion amongst volunteers or at least amongst program managers about um, evacuation. It was always, you know, we're just going to sit this out, see what type of precautions we can put in place to make sure everyone is safe and healthy. Um, and to everyone's surprise, including post um, staff, local staff, and U.S. hires that were living in the Dominican Republic, on March 15th, we received an email from our uh, country director telling us that we would be consolidated to the capital, Santo Domingo, within 24 hours, and we would be sent home. We were being evacuated. Um, and there was no discussion of when we would come back. It was just pack all of your belongings and you need to get to the Capitol by morning. We received that email about 5 p.m. at night. And in the Dominican Republic, many of our volunteers are along the Haitian Dominican border um, due to that being the most needed areas. Um, and so we were evacuated at um, and it basically went back to your um, homes of residence. And I was fortunate enough to have a support system to be able to come back 
um, to where my parents were living in Minnesota, a very different climate in mid-March than you can imagine the Dominican Republic had um, welcomed me with over the previous three years. Um, but there were volunteers that didn't have homes of residence, that didn't have you know, a financial foundation to fall back on coming back to the country amid a pandemic and amid you know, increasing unemployment numbers, which really um, led me to get involved and see what type of resources of support we could offer them. Um, and a lot of different RPCVs were incredible and created this massive Facebook group um, supporting evacuated Peace Corps volunteers in any way they possibly could, you know, lending their couches, lending their spare guest room amid a pandemic to people who needed a place to stay until they could figure out what they were going to do. Um, and from there, there were just a flood of different initiatives taking place, discussing how we could get unemployment to volunteers and a lot of evacuated Peace Corps volunteers expressing the different challenges they were facing on these different online platforms, which led to a report spearheaded by the Women of Color Advancing Peace and Security, um, led by Miriam Foote, a fellow evacuated Peace Corps volunteer and Bonnie Jenkins. And then the National Peace Corps Association was also extremely involved, helping us adver advocate for unemployment opportunities. Um, and so I just kind of want to lead that into this has really been a great pause, I think, for Peace Corps to discuss, you know, the different areas that it can improve itself. And I'm very thankful for, you know, the community I think we all have experienced as we kind of reintegrate back into the U.S. after. I know we talk a lot about reverse culture shock. Um, but with that, I really want to yield my team to, or my time to Stephen to talk further about the Peace Corps Connect to the Future report. Yeah, well, thank you so much, uh, Anna. I, you know, I think Anna's story is a really, really important one. Um, and, I, and I really want to emphasize it. It's, you know, that her experience and the experience that the more than 7,000 evacuated volunteers and their communities um, went through and are going through. Um, as, as Rock Loxley, who's one of the a fellow evacuated volunteer, wrote recently in a really moving essay, um, it's not over. Um, you know, the, what, what they're experiencing and obviously the, the, the communities, what they're experiencing. Um, those are, uh, you, can, you can read a lot more from other evacuated volunteers um, at the NPCA website or in, in Worldview magazine. Um, but that, that experience of going through the evacuation and coming home to a country that was being hit by a pandemic, um, that was in real economic turmoil, and then very quickly um, was racked by protests against racial injustice, um, was um, cr created an unprecedented situation. I think it's important for us to recognize, of course, that while we're having the conversation here, um, as some folks have noted in the, in the chat earlier, um, there is a, a, a trial for the, um, for Derek Chauvin, right, accused of murdering George Floyd, right? So this is not over. The big conversations that we need to be having about racial justice are not over. Um, and the things that got addressed in the report, Peace Corps Connect to the Future, the things that shaped the report, it began with the evacuation, kind of created this unprecedented moment um, for the Peace Corps community, um, led to eight town halls, and I'll dive in just momentarily into what those were. Um, that brought people together over the course of uh, a couple of weeks. And then a Global Ideas Summit to present all the ideas from the town halls where we've gone into stuff in depth um, and to kind of further bring together discussions, um, try and figure out um, what, what should this moment mean for the Peace Corps community? What are the big ideas um, for Peace Corps and the Peace Corps community going forward? Um, and you know, starting with the real big basic one, should Peace Corps continue to exist? Um, and the answer was a resounding yes, that there is more work to do uh, than ever. Um, and again, I would underscore sort of in this moment this morning, right, on the announcement went out that Peace Corps response, something created 25 years ago as Crisis Corps, is for the second time in its history, only the second time, going to deploy volunteers in the United States. They were deployed after Hurricane Katrina, um, and a number of return volunteers uh, and first-time volunteers participated in that. Um, so this is an unprecedented moment, and yes, guess what? There's lots of work to do in this country that um, people with Peace Corps skills need to do also. As And again, as anyone who served in AmeriCorps would, would tell you as well, those kind of very similar experiences. Um, if we could hop to the next slide, Sarah. Um, 
we took as a cue um, and as, as a real touchstone um, for the report, which came out of this Global Ideas Summit, some remarks that were uh, given by Kul Chandra Gautam, who's a um, former deputy uh, director for UNICEF, right? A Nepalese dip diplomat whose uh, early life and education were really shaped by, by Peace Corps volunteers. Um, and, you know, and, and, and I do think it's important to kind of understand the, 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 um, what's, what's at stake here in, in what he said. Our increasingly interconnected world demands global solidarity, not charity, to solve global problems that transcend national borders like the specter of war, terrorism, racism, climate change, and pandemics like COVID-19. And more than any other group of Americans, I believe that returned Peace Corps volunteers can instill a sense of a more enlightened America as a part of, not apart from, a more just, peaceful, and prosperous world, right? So that kind of sets the task ahead of us um, and the things that we tried to tackle in this report. Um, and if you could hop to the next slide too, Sarah, thank you. Um, and, and I want to say, um, for those who saw the previous panel, um, uh, Katrina's comments, um, uh, Charles's comments, um, I think were the, really uh, resonate with a lot of the discussions that took place as, and went into this report, and that this report is meant, meant to address um, in some big cross-cutting themes, as well as the, the first chapter of the report. Um, the, the big cross-cutting theme that reaches across the whole range of issues um, that were addressed in uh, examining how do we reshape and retool um, and reimagine Peace Corps for a Change World. Number one is like the Peace Corps community must be a leader in addressing systemic racism, right? So that means tackling diversity and equity and inclusion, you know, in, in the Peace Corps itself and not just in recruiting, but in support all through the whole programs. Um, but as an institution, as any um, uh, institution has historically been shaped by systemic racism, okay, how do you come to terms with that? And if the Peace Corps is supposed to represent what's best, best about um, US American ideals, um, okay, so how do we do that? Even while we're trying to do the important work at home here in the United States of building this more perfect union. Um, the other uh, second cross-cutting theme is that the Peace Corps agency, it needs to stand by its community, right? It's the people that make Peace Corps what it is, right? The nearly quarter million return volunteers, people in communities across the world, the staff, um, host country staff, as well as U.S. staff um, who have served, the families, um, that these are people who are really committed to these ideals and are carrying out and living these, these ideals and the work they continue to do um, and uh, their communities back in the US. Um, and then number three, um, you know, this is the time, right, to make big change. You've got all the volunteers, all the volunteers are at home. Um, co not coincidentally, after this report was completed, um, we had some discussions with a, a number of former Peace Corps directors. And time and again, they said, this addresses so much stuff um, that we, understand, you know, it needed to happen, you know, I wish could have happened years ago. Um, and some things that were really amplified by the evacuation, such as like needing much greater support for returning volunteers. Um, but the uh, former director saying, yep, you know, this is, uh, this is the time, you, this is, and we need to make these big changes now. Um, in terms of the, you know, the, the chapters have listed over there on the, on the right on this slide, uh, the kind of the eight, eight big areas. Um, super quickly, I'll run, run through those because I know we're running a little bit, real, little bit late, but want to make sure we have time for the discussion. But again, if we're talking about um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, that's something that needs to be addressed kind of from, from start to finish and beyond, again, as, as we heard in the, in the last, last panel. Um, recruiting is something that, you know, and that ties together, of course, with, with diversity and with equity. Um, like, how do you make sure that service, national service, Peace Corps service is actually accessible um, to people who come from um, economic backgrounds, um, you know, that um, uh, right now make it impossible, right? Don't even, don't even make it a, a possibility. Um, and, you know, and for the evacuated volunteers, right, this point really, really was driven home, they, needing to have much greater support for volunteers during the, the readjustment at home. Um, and because, you know, one, one of the things to, to me that's especially clear with that is, um, 
even just if, if you put it in terms that, you know, members of Congress or people who care about budgets can understand, you've got this investment in all these people, right? Um, and, you know, sending them overseas, and that's, that's, you know, that's where the expense comes, right? Supporting the volunteers and the projects that they're doing in the communities. Um, but the real payoff will come for the United States um, and the communities in all these years to come. Um, and so you want to you want to make sure that you're you're making those making those connections, providing that support um, to amplify the impact um, that can go on for a lifetime. Um, speaking of funding, um, you know that's one of the chapters uh, that's that's addressed. Um, and uh, you know the budget for the Peace Corps has been flat for six years running now. Um, and one of the things that the report certainly calls for is aspiring to reach um, 10,000 volunteers in the years ahead. Um, and um, before I wrap up, we'll actually share some, some of the results from this report that think, where things are already um, kind of coming to bear fruit um, connected to budget and other areas as well. Programs, of course, need to change. Um, the, the world has changed. So we need to think of how, how, does, how is Peace Corps programming going to match the changed world? Um, those second and third goals um, in Peace Corps lingo, people um, you know, will use those for shorthand. The second goal, helping to foster understanding um, in other countries, understanding of Americans in other countries. Um, and the third goal, helping to bring the world back home, bring that understanding back home. Um, to the United States. Um, and traditionally, those are kind of given um, um, not a whole lot of attention, um, not a whole lot of emphasis. And the third goal is maybe seen as something kind of touchy-feely. It's nice, it's knowledge, it's, um, it's understanding. Um, but the reality is, um, if you talk to many, many, many Peace Corps volunteers, um, including one I talked to recently uh, interviewed an epidemiologist, Anne Ramoyne, one of the leading epidemiologists in this country. She talked about the third gold Peace Corps and the understanding and ability she learned to listen in a community. Um, that's a matter of life and death. Um, in a time of global health concerns, that's a matter of life and death. Um, it's not just, it's not just, oh, it's nice. It'll, it's all, um, will make, make uh, a happier world, even though our mission is to build peace and friendship overall for the Peace Corps. Um, there's, there's a lot at stake in um, building that understanding and bringing the understanding of working in communities to our communities in the United States. Um, uh, the, the seventh chapter kind of tackling manage, management policies for a changing world um, that again, kind of goes hands in hand with like stuff has is, stuff is changed. The, the reality on the ground has changed. How do we make sure that we're adjusting to that? Um, and the last one, communicating, like how, do, how does Peace Corps do the outreach? How do we tell the stories about the communities, about the volunteers? Um, how do we make people uh, better understand what Peace Corps is and does um, and is aspiring to, to accomplish? Just in, in wrapping up, I, I want to say um, I think many folks here may already be aware on March 1st, Congressman John Garamendi, who's the, the one return Peace Corps volunteer who's in Congress right now, um, he, on March 1st, he introduced the Peace Corps Reauthorization Act of 2021. Um, and that's the most sweeping Peace Corps legislation in decades. Um, and it addresses a whole range of issues, including funding, um, creating a much higher level of funding, um, and aspiring to get Peace Corps up funding where, where there can be 10,000 volunteers out there in the field. Um, it, it tackles um, health care. It, it, it tackles insurance. It tackles whistleblower um, uh, protections um, and a, a range of other issues. It, it, it tackles um, menstrual equity for volunteers who are serving around the world, right? And this is, it's big and important stuff. Um, and certainly um, there's an opportunity for many folks out there, whether you're part of the Peace Corps community formally or want to consider yourself a believer in, an inspiring member in, in the ideals. Um, we can use the advocacy support and, and it's, it, it's actually, it's up to us now to do the heavy lift. The legislation is there. It's up to us to let members of Congress know, you know what? This is really important. Um, this is important for our country. It's important for the communities where Peace Corps has served and needs to serve again. Um, and it's important for us trying to re-engage with the world. Um, so I will wrap things up there. Thanks so much, Pat and all for hosting us today. Alert here, now as we close the symposium, we have an update from Peace Corps headquarters. 
And pleased we are that Darlene Grant, special assistant to the director, Peace Corps, can join us for this important closing segment. Dr. Grant served in Cambodia 2009 to 2011 as a mid-career volunteer. Her experience and skills led her in 2012 to be assigned as country director in Mongolia and then to open Peace Corps in Kosovo in 2015, where she worked as country director until 2019. It's an honor. Please join us, Darlene, please. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you, Nicola and Patricia for the invitation uh, to this important event. I would correct that I did not open Kosovo or my colleague Stephen would be um, looking for me afterwards. I was the second, second country director in uh, Kosovo and um, uh, uh, had a wonderful experience. Um, I, I, you know, I began as I was watching our clock to start trying, uh, attempting to cut my remarks, but I, 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 will, I will proceed as, as they were originally written because I think everyone is interested in knowing where we're going, what we're doing and why. Um, it, it's an honor to be a part of this event I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed the stories, the remarks which precede. All the speakers' comments in, in, and even the comments in the chat box have affirmed a truism connected to my own Peace Corps experience, as Daryl as stated, a, mid, a midlife volunteer and a volunteer of color. That is, the relationship is the thing. It's the medium in which a student dreaming outside of her or his humble circumstances, a struggling village English teacher, a, a mother of six who, who's getting up the courage to go apply for a micro loan, um, a, a host family who sees the education of their daughter differently because of a Peace Corps volunteer that inspires host country national staff members to, to join a 2.30 a.m. all staff meeting just because they really want to have all the tools they need to support volunteers. And the relationship is the medium in which the Peace Corps volunteer flourishes. Um, my remarks center, center on the country, the community, and the individuals with whom volunteers and staff interact. It's my honor to provide a few remarks on behalf of the aspirational, wonderful, sometimes messy, sometimes flawed, inspirational, human, heart-driven, federal government endeavor <laughs> that is the Peace Corps. Uh, on behalf of the 2000, over 2,985 Peace Corps staff, a, a number which includes 2,045 host country national staff, to all the returned Peace Corps volunteers present and those who aspire, um, thank you for your service. Thank you for your leadership and your enduring commitment to this agency and support of National Peace Corps Association. We couldn't, we could not do it without you. In my capacity as senior advisor in the office of the director, um, I would love to use some of the words from acting director uh, Carol Spahn um, made during Peace Corps week to explain where we are, where we are on this journey and what we see ahead. Let me start by reaffirming that our top priority for returning um, volunteers is returning volunteers to service. We will return volunteers to service as soon as conditions allow and the health and safety of our volunteers, staff and host communities can be relatively guaranteed. As we all know, the global COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, and localized situations are continuing to shift on a daily basis, especially with the changes related to vaccine accessibility and new variants uh, of the virus. Therefore, we are not yet able to offer a firm timeframe to when our volunteers re will return to the field. However, uh, I can assure you that we continue to review and assess each country's particular situation based on a robust set of medical, programmatic, administrative, and logistical criteria. Right. 
Each of Peace Corps posts is monitoring the situation closely and collaborating um, with local communities, host country governments, local partners, uh, and, and in-country uh, stakeholders the U.S. Embassy and Peace Corps headquarters, all working together to make the most appropriate um, um, timing decisions. We are very aware of evacuated volunteers, strong desire to return to service. And we continue to receive significant volume of new applications. We expect even more applications once we have volunteers back in the field. That being said, we announced several weeks ago that we will require all volunteers to receive a COVID vaccine before service. This decision was made to protect the health and safety of our volunteers, um, but also the health of our host country staff and the host communities. Invitees and evacuate vo evacuated volunteers will be required uh, to provide proof of vaccine as part of the medical clearance process to return to service. At this time, these vaccines will not be facilitated or reimbursed by Peace Corps. Peace Corps staff at each post will have the opportunity to be vaccinated prior to the return of volunteers to service overseas. A lot of our overseas staff um, are already being vaccinated and host country governments such as Guyana have been adding our staff members to their vaccine priority list. This is a real testament to host country government uh, recognition of the value of our staff's contribution to community development. These changes in the current pandemic response terrain have really given us hope that we are rounding the corner. We are one step closer to returning our volunteers to service. Apart from vaccines, volunteers and staff will also be expected to comply with host country requirements regarding quarantine, testing, et cetera. And we will continue to pay attention to implementing safeguards. As for headquarters, the agency continues to follow CDC and other public health guidance and will apply comply with all applicable executive orders about workplace safety. Um, there's often questions about, well, so what are you guys doing with your Peace Corps funds while there are no volunteers in the field? Um, since evacuation, um, we've gotten that question again and again, and we understand where it's coming from. Our volunteers are usually the most visible, the most uh, front and center element of our agency. They are our life's blood, as many of you have said this, this afternoon. Something we need to do better as an agency is to highlight the critical work and contributions of our staff, our volunteers, our volunteer counterparts, and our partners in addition to the work of our volunteers. We hear that. I've heard that this, this afternoon. The work has never stopped during our time without volunteers. Some may argue that the work has even increased, I raise my hand. Um, as host country staff, counterparts, partners have stepped up um, in incredible ways and picked up right where our volunteers left off. During the time without volunteers, we have established various task force mandated to improve systems throughout our agency. These task forces have been busy developing new tools, frameworks um, that will be implemented across the agency. And I'll, I'll get to a little bit more of that in a few moments. There's also some amazingly creative and innovative work being done um, uh, by staff around the world. In Ukraine, for just one example, post staff have been continuing efforts with PEPFAR Right? They have been able to repurpose PEPFAR funding to develop and implement a cross-regional program to support vulnerable children, vulnerable youth um, in the country through food vouchers and HIV case counseling. Uh, amazing. Um, and as many of you may have heard, um, we have a uh, piloted a virtual service program for, for any of us older volunteers, this is quite a, an unimaginable 
um, IVF virtual service. Um, and um, some of you were joking uh, about email being invented long after service. Um, a good example uh, of a project was by RPCV Samara, who coordinated a local nonprofit in Costa Rica, whose goals was to create a domestic version of the Peace Corps, appropriately called the Costa Rica Corps. All of this was done virtually. Virtual volunteers are using uh, platforms like Zoom, et cetera to uh, expand the service to counterparts in, in our host country uh, partners. Another interesting area of work that was announced publicly for the first time today, thank you, uh, Daryl, for mentioning that, um, is that Peace Corps response opportunity to work on the front lines of the COVID response in the United States, um, hot off the presses, that um, this work is being coordinated with FEMA and will mirror a similar domestic effort that involved our volunteers back in 2005, if you'll remember, when we were involved in the Hurricane Katrina response efforts. Please keep your eye on the space and, the, and, and, and more announcements to come on this very important and exciting effort. On another area of work, uh, we wanna be sure to highlight that our work to communicate better with our PCVs is ongoing. One of the things we can never underestimate is the work which over 24,000, uh, 240,000 return Peace Corps volunteers across the US uh, and the world are doing and the many ways in which they are applying the skills and abilities they learned in service and in their daily lives. We hear you, we hear you. Returning Peace Corps volunteers have gone on to play leadership roles on the front lines of international development, domestic and foreign policy, uh, serving in Congress and as ambassadors, uh, uh, pro the professor who led the, the earlier um, uh, panel of student volunteers, at, at the list goes on and on. Um, it is important for us as an institution uh, and a country to recognize and celebrate the contributions that our PCVs continue to make. And we are calling their contributions uh, post-service, the domestic dividends of Peace Corps. During um, and, and since the evacuation, returned volunteers have been integral to the resettlement of 7,000 um, evacuated volunteers. You've offered career counseling, you've offered job referrals, shelter meals, and much, much more. Um, and I think this is a real testament to our PCV's close connection to the agency and their commitment to their, their Peace Corps family. Uh, this outpouring of support is something that we cannot overlook. And we are identifying better ways to communicate and interact with our return Peace Corps volunteers into the future. All that is a long way of saying or answering the question, well, what are you doing if you don't have volunteers? Uh, also, our, our top priority um, for being a better agency um, um, is to institutionalize a commitment to racial diversity, equity, and inclusion. This aspiration to have the Peace Corps represent the true depth and diversity of the United States has been guiding our recruitment and practices for years. But as our panelists have noted, we have not always seen that commitment in action. In fact, in 2019, 34% of our volunteers identified as volunteers of color, um, which was a huge improvement from about 10 years earlier when that number was something closer to 19%. And, and, and our first cohorts of volunteers in the Peace Corps were, racial, were much more racially diverse, representative of Sergeant Shriver's belief that the Peace Corps should be an opportunity for all Americans. I have to be careful when I state this and, and present these statistics because it's not in defense of the Peace Corps, right? 
It is just a statement of where we were, where we are, and a roadmap to where we need to go and, and continue our commitment. We believe that addressing systemic racism and injustice in all of its forms is inextricably tied to our mission. And we have not said that enough and why I am so proud to be here making these statements today. We stand against the marginalization of any people. The Peace Corps at its very core is about honoring diversity uh, uh, around the world and building relationships and opportunity and fostering equity and inclusion. It is essential that our workplace, our volunteer systems, and our culture reflect these values. Through our task force on uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, we are actively evaluating these structures and program policies to ensure that our workplace and our volunteer systems and our culture as an agency reflects our commitment. A few weeks ago, the Biden administration through an executive order mandated the establishment of an agency equity council, uh, AEC, Peace Corps needs another acronym. And at, at, at each government agency, the defined structure that formal, uh, provides formal accountability for processes um, and policies and changing the structures as we commit to do. These are marching orders that we can get behind. Uh, let me restate that. These are marching orders that we are getting behind. Our, our PCVs have offered many recommendations, as was mentioned um, in every panel here today, as was mentioned in the uh, in PCA report. I'm happy to share with you that we will be hosting a thought leaders forum on this topic of uh, diversity, equity, inclusion. Please again, watch the Peace Corps website for more information on that. It, we're aiming for a May date. The Peace Corps Connect to the Future Report has been an incredible contribution to our agency improvement effort. We really appreciate the Connect to the Future Report. I can personally say I have read that report three, four, five times uh, and did a line by line review and, uh, and, and am sincere in sharing our appreciation. We share our community's uh, uh, sense of um, statement in uh, sense in that report. Now is the moment for the Peace Corps agency to enact dramatic change. We agree. Um, we need to meet this moment on so many levels. This report and our own directives and our own commitment and our own internal gazing at ourselves and analysis and commitment um, uh, moves us in this direction. As you know, we are all anxiously awaiting news of who the next director will be. <laughs> to be completely honest, I'm as uh, excited and anxious as probably everyone else on this call, right? While we are waiting on that announcement, we have been very fortunate as an agency to have wonderful, energetic, newly appointed staff members join just over the last um, couple of months now. Uh, many of the senior positions are quickly being filled, a testament to a broader commitment to the Peace Corps. The Office of Volunteer Recruitment and Selection, the Chief Financial Office, the Office of Management, the Office of Health Services, Communications, um, the Office of Congressional Relations, the team is growing. Right. These staff members, all appointed by the Biden administration, offer the agency a wealth of experience, talent, um, energy, and commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we look forward to their contributions. Uh, and, and we will meet the challenge of this historic moment. Finally, <laughs> uh, and I appreciate um, your staying with this report. We are preparing for a future Peace Corps that demonstrates how the agency during the this time of uncertainty, this time of loss, 
um, this time um, to build back better and to be relevant more than ever. Um, we're gonna return safely. Um, we're gonna return stronger. Um, we're gonna return um, more thoughtfully. Um, um, and, and in a time where this world so badly, badly craves mutual respect, solidarity and community, we are going to be ready to live up to that. And we join our PCVs and ask our PCVs to join us in ensuring um, what one of our panelists said, that the story embedded in each of us continues to spread and be shared. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Darlene, for uh, joining us today and for reporting such good news, really. We, we need it. And we so appreciate it coming from an agency about which we are all passionate. We share those mutual values. So thank you. I'm, I think um, uh, I can sincerely say that uh, Acting Director Carol Spawn is fortunate to have you on her side and by her side, shall we say. This symposium has met its goal, I believe. It certainly has for me. It's presented us a learning experience. I hope you too have learned and that the symposium motivates all of us to become citizen advocates for legislation proposing more Peace Corps. Call your local representative and senator and get your name on their screen so they know you want more Peace Corps. There's information in the chat about how you can do that. I want now to offer a personal message as we close. We've gathered today bringing us into the discussion about the impact of Peace Corps over 60 years and the opportunity to shape Peace Corps 2.0. We've heard about Peace Corps experiences, the founding efforts, recommendations for the future, and now news of the agency. We're reminded again about the power of activism, the power of students, the many people who have shaped Peace Corps and are impressing us. I leave us with one big challenge. Us, we, the passionate Peace Corps community, what can we do to promote research that measures and documents the impact of Peace Corps? How can we turn our thought provoking stories, our life altering relationships into the research that documents the impact of this bold ambitious effort that promotes socioeconomic justice globally? How can we make Peace Corps values and programs more visible? And now it's time to give credit and thanks to the dozens of people who brought this symposium together and who created the exhibit, Peace Corps at 60, inside the volunteer experience. First, I wanna thank all the symposium speakers. You made the program come alive. You brought your best thinking, your experiences, your insights, your good humor, and your tolerance for the ambiguity of the internet to share with us. Your names are on the program sent with the link for today's symposium if you'd like to check that out. We thank every single one of you. On the slide, you see the names of others who made the symposium happen. And I'm just gonna name the institutions represented here. The staff at American University Museum without whom the symposium and the exhibition simply could not have happened. At every single turn, that staff rose above the call of duty. I, in fact, told them they're behaving like Peace Corps volunteers. The Peace Corps volunteers provided the content, but the university, American University Museum staff literally made it happen. They have established a high bar to which the Museum of the Peace Corps experience now aspires. 
We are grateful to the Museum of the Peace Corps Experience exhibit team, whose members also appear on the slide. And I wanna give a shout out to Leslie Nellis and the staff at Peace Corps Community Archive at the American University Library. All of you, all volunteers may deposit your papers, documents, letters, photos into the Peace Corps Community Archive. Those deposits will be made available for education and research long into the future. And we're grateful to the symposium planning team for putting heads together as we framed and prepared for the symposium. Your and their import made, import made a difference. Special thanks to our sponsors, National Peace Corps Association, American University, American University Museum, and the Committee for a Museum of the Peace Corps Experience where we have nearly two dozen volunteers contributing. And now you attendees, thank you for invigorating the symposium with your interest, your comments, your questions, your presence. We wish you a good evening and a lovely spring.